When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith declared, I could not be shaken. Now, as we shift back and leave our field trip in the Pearl of Great Price to go back to the, these postscripts at the end of the Doctrine and Covenants, like I said, there's a lot of history that we need to, to wrestle with, with really controversial topics and ones that can really hit home as far as our own marriage is concerned and our own experience with race. Uh, these two revelations, or the, I should say the declarations of the revelations that had been received, uh, have everything to do with our own experience. And so I hope we can see ourselves here and learn how they navigated these changes so that we can navigate whatever change might be on its way, since there are many great and important things yet pertaining to the kingdom of God that someday we'll need to learn. Now for the first, we have to wrestle with plural marriage again. Now that was maybe the longest video we've had all year uh, where we spent, what, three and a half hours talking about plural marriage when we studied section 132. Now that was largely because we had, what, 60 something verses to go through verse by verse with a lot of controversial possibilities there. Now with the official declarations, if we're just going to do verse by verse, well, we've got, what, three pages uh, that we need to, dis to discuss. But let me give you a little bit of backstory so that this makes sense. And I tr I'll try not to belabor the point too much. Now, in the Church Gospel Topics essays, which are online, very well worth your reads, there is one about plural marriage that then expands into three. There's a lot of information here because it's such a complex uh, topic. And the first, what the, those three topics do is they split up plural marriage into three historical time periods. And the first has to do with Joseph Smith's plural marriage. So somewhere in the mid-1830s, when he's first learning about it in uh, the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis, up until his martyrdom. And so how was that practiced? We talked more about that than anything else in when we studied section 132. If you need a refresher, go back and, and see that. There's a second stage, which is from 1852 till 1890. And that's what we're talking about with, with this first official declaration. 1852 is when, <laughs> when Orson Pratt got the unenviable uh, uh, responsibility in general conference to go out and announce that we are living in plural marriage and try to defend it scripturally. Uh, Brigham Young asked Orson Pratt to do it, and nobody better to do it than Orson. Uh, he was a genius. And he did an admirable job of going through and saying, okay, here's the scriptural backup for, for this practice. But 1852 is when, uh, when the blood drained from, from the rest of, of Protestant uh, America. And it's like, what? The Latter-day Saints are doing what out there in Utah? Uh, and they've been doing it for a while, even back in Nauvoo, ah, oh, perish the thought. And so from 1852, it becomes what they call domestic polygamy because it's, everybody knows about it now. So it can be out in the open. And we can actually live kind of the way that we picture this being, of finally being able to raise up seed unto God. That couldn't happen in, in Nauvoo. And, and having uh, righteous families uh, and, and sacrificial couples and, and families raising children with, that are willing to live an Abrahamic life of Abrahamic sacrifices and Abrahamic faith through Abrahamic trials, okay? Well, that lasts until 1890. And as I'll walk you through the history briefly, uh, it becomes harder and harder and harder to live because of increased opposition, especially politically. And when you, live, when you try to honor, obey, and sustain the law, when you, like it or not, are subject to kings, presidents, rulers, or magistrates, well, their politics are going to have a say on how you live your life. That's just the nature of it, okay? That's part of the social contract. Now, 1890 is when Wilfred Woodruff receives a revelation on what to do about all this. 
And the, the short of it is stop practicing plural marriage. In the United States where it is, it is condemned by law, you cannot practice plural marriage. Now, it was still practiced on lower scales in Canada and in Mexico, where the United States did not have jurisdiction. But even that, I'll even put it this way, even throughout the 1870s and 80s, plural marriage was, was getting smaller and smaller. Fewer and fewer people were being asked to live it. Uh, and there's some interesting history behind all that. But by 1890, it's serious. Okay, God has revealed it to Wilfred Woodruff. We're not going to live this anymore. And, but it's, like I said, still practiced in, in other jurisdictions. Um, and there's still kind of a question of, well, how do we end this? Some were like, sweet, this is the best news I've ever heard. I, you know how hard it is to support this many families? And then they were, they were like abandoning wives and children. And Wilfred Woodruff was like, that is never, never what I intended. And that's not what God intended. That's not honorable. And so you need to continue supporting and providing for these families. They are yours. You are theirs. This is, you've been sealed. Well, I believe it was Benjamin Harrison when he was president of the United States. He even established or granted general amnesty to say, okay, what you, those who have already practiced plural marriage, already entered into those, those marital bonds, you can, you're no longer enemies of state. And so there's amnesty. You're not going to go to prison for that. And that way, plural marriage can kind of die out naturally on its own. Well, that was, again, good news for some, hard news for others. It was a trial of faith. Sister Zina D.H. Young said, all of our faith was, trialed the day, was tried the day that the, the, uh, the manifesto was, was announced. But the end of plural marriage was in some ways almost as messy as the beginning. Where it's like, well, is this only in the United States? Is it still true? Is it just a practice that's ending? Or has the doctrine changed? Is it exceptions and rules we talked about last time? Well, how does this all fit? And so there is a third period of plural marriage that the Gospel Topics essay deals with. And that's what we call post-manifesto. The manifesto is what we're studying right now. 1890, we're not practicing that anymore. But it took, oh, about a decade and a half for things to kind of finally get kind of set in stone. And you see, oh, B.H. Roberts, for example, elected to Congress. Once, once, the, once we stop plural marriage, then it's like, okay, the biggest thing that was keeping you from statehood is now behind you. And so, fine, you can be a state. And you can elect your own representatives. And so they do. They elect B.H. Uh, Roberts, who was a polygamist. And the government was like, under no conditions can a polygamist have their seat in the Congress. And so, back to the drawing board, elect somebody else. Okay, how's that for democratic wishes? Um, but then later, Reed Smoot, who happened to be an apostle, was elected to be a, 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 the senator from Utah. I mean, it was kind of cool in, our, in, in the 1900s, uh, 1950s, when President Benson got to be both an apostle and a member of Eisenhower's cabinet. Well, that's old news compared to Reed Smoot. But again, they're like, nope, Reed Smoot cannot uh, take his place because he's a Latter-day Saint. And everyone's like, but he's not a polygamist. And he never has been. That should actually tell you something, that if there's even apostles that aren't living plural marriage, it's not required for everyone. And so Reed Smoot they go, goes through this, this hearing on Capitol Hill that lasts for years. It's called the Reed Smoot hearings. Best book you can ever read on it is by Kathleen Flake, The Politics of American Religious Identity. And she walks through the whole process. It's, a, it's an amazing, uh, amazing history. And eventually, he is seated. He's allowed to maintain the, the seat that he was uh, democratically elected to. But it's a, it's a tough process. And they subpoena Joseph F. Smith and make him testify in court and explain plural marriage and how does revelation work and... Oh, I mean, they, they put President Smith between a rock and a hard place, believe me. But eventually, President Smith issues what they call the second manifesto to just say, it's not just that we're, we're keeping a law of the land within the jurisdiction of the United States. The days of the exception have completely ended. And we are back to the days of the rule, which is monogamy. And nowhere in the church will plural marriage be, be practiced. In fact, nowhere will it, be, will it be tolerated as far as those that want to enter into a new, uh, a new plural marriage. That's the fastest way to get excommunicated. Okay? 
So those, those are the three time periods, Joseph Smith's period, the Utah period, and this brief post-manifesto period. So what we need to deal with here, leading up to the 1890 declaration of the manifesto, is what are the saints dealing with? And it is opposition by opposition by persecution by persecution. And most of it is in, in legal terms. I mean, the saints left the United States and then they went to Mexican territory in what they wanted to create as this kingdom of Deseret. Well, the United States followed them <laughs> and they win the, the Mexican-American War and now they have all of that area from Texas on through the Rockies and on to, uh, to California. So now we're back in the United States. Well, can we still be the state of Deseret and do our own thing? We, you guys believe in religious freedom, right? That is a privilege that we claim. And plural marriage is part of, of worshiping God according to the dictates of our own conscience. Well, that went against the dictates of the conscience of, of Protestant America. And so it, it really began in 1856. By the time uh, Orson Pratt announces it publicly in 1852, it's kind of late for a political party to get its party machinery uh, up and running to go oppose it. But by 1856, you have a brand new party, political party, called the Republicans. And they run on a platform where they specifically say, one of our goals for the nation is to end the twin relics of barbarism, which they define as slavery, and polygamy, the twin relics of barbarism. Well, the one they're going to take on first, obviously, is slavery. That's the, the deeper uh, and more complicated issue. Well, if that's 1856, then by 1860, the next election, where Abraham Lincoln is elected president on the Republican platform and the Republican Party, well, what are we going to deal with first? We're going to deal with slavery. And the nation rips apart. Uh, it, it's so interesting that in that time period, uh, Lincoln himself was like, okay, you got two relics uh, of barbarism to, to combat. And he's like, I'm not even going to worry about the second one. Uh, I've got my hands full with the first. You see, during the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Stephen A. Douglas, who at one point had defended the saints, now had gone completely against him. By the way, Joseph Smith even prophesied that was a mistake because someday you'll want to be president and you won't be. Just FYI. And that was a prophecy that, that was fulfilled uh, to a relative no-namer uh, when he lost elections to to Abraham Lincoln. Well, Lincoln during the time, so you got Douglas on the one hand calling Mormonism a cancer that needs to be cut out with a knife from the body politic. Yikes. Meanwhile, what is Lincoln saying to Douglas? It's like, wait a minute, you're kind of pushing popular sovereignty on the, on the basis of the Southern Democrats. They want popular sovereignty to defend slavery. Well, Aren't the Mormons just wanting popular sovereignty to defend polygamy? Now, ultimately, my platform is to eliminate them both. But doesn't this kind of push the hypocrisy on the part of, of the Southern Democrats that, oh, they only want popular sovereignty for themselves? Careful, Stephen A. Douglas. Uh, what, what are you trying to, to say here? Because it suggests that what you're really after is just defending slavery, not popular sovereignty, because the, the if the principle is supposed to hold in the South, then it's supposed to hold in, in the Great Basin, too. It's supposed to hold in Utah. Well, make up your mind. Uh, at one point, by the way, even during Lincoln's presidency, when he was uh, up to his eyeballs in trying to preserve the Union and, and get rid of the, the first relic of barbarism, a Latter-day Saint went to meet with him and asked him, what's your, what's your plan with Brigham Young and the Latter-day Saints in Utah? And, and Lincoln's response was classic. He said, you know, when I was a kid out on the farm and we were plowing the field and we had to get, we had to clear the field first and get rid of the timber, you know, so you cut down the trees and pull out the, the logs and so, the stumps and so on. He said, there'd be times where a, a stump, a log was so big or so deep that there was no way to dig it up and it was too wet to burn it out. And so what are you going to do? We just plowed around it. And that's my position with the Mormons. Go tell Brigham Young I'm planning just to plow around him. And Brigham was stoked with that. So great, you don't mess with us, we won't mess with you. And it was kind of a don't ask, don't tell, and just leave it to themselves, and I'm not going to deal with that because I can't. Well, Lincoln eventually then dies, and without his kind of oh, easygoing willingness to compromise, 
Once the first relic of barbarism was gone, then the Republicans could ramp up their efforts to uproot the second uh, relic of barbarism. And they pulled out all the stops. And it started in 1862, so Lincoln's still around for that. They passed the Morrill Act, which outlaws bigamy in the U.S. territories. Do you have any idea who they're thinking about? Uh, now, bigamy was hard because it was difficult to prove that it was taking place. So in 1882, that gets strengthened with what they call the Edmonds Act, which outlawed bigamous cohabitation. See, that was easier to prove. We might not be able to prove that they're married, or if they don't have certificates or whatever it might be, but if they're living together, then who cares if they're married or not? We're just going to call it bigamous cohabitation, and we can, we can prosecute them on that. In fact, anyone found guilty of that was, lost their right to vote, which is interesting. Again, they're trying to do everything they can within their oh, kind of political loopholes to say, well, if we can take away the right to vote of those that would vote for polygamy, See, that was, that was what the mistake they made in granting women the right to vote. Uh, Utah was one of the very first places in the country that women could vote. And the thought back east was, well, these poor Latter-day Saint women that are being held under the ecclesiastical thumb, if they just had a voice, they would cry out for freedom from plural marriage. Well, even in the women's newspapers at the time, uh, they, they would say things like, that is, is folly to the extreme. Uh, but we'd love the right to vote, please. And then when it was granted them, what did they vote for? They voted to defend plural marriage as part of their religion. Like, oh, that backfired on the East. So it's like, okay, dang it, that didn't work. So we got to get rid of the vote for women, get rid of the vote for anyone that would vote for plural marriage. So let's imprison and, and disenfranchise anyone that we, can, that we can catch in the act. And we don't even have to catch them in marriage, just cohabitation is enough. Well, that still wasn't strong enough. So five years later, 1887, the Edmonds Act now becomes the Edmonds-Tucker Act. And this one, we're not just going to send individual Latter-day Saints to prison for cohabitating. We're going to disincorporate the whole LDS church. We will force it to cease functioning in terms of any kind of legal entity, which means you can't hold property over a certain amount of, uh, of, of value. You can't, you can't function. There will be no LDS church. Now, in a nation that uh, proclaims in the First Amendment in the Bill of Rights, freedom of religion, how does the United States government navigate that? Let alone, how do the, navig the, the Latter-day Saints navigate uh, their side of things? Well, on the Saints' side, they're going to appeal these things. In fact, they're going to do everything they can to push back against the government, saying what you're doing is unconstitutional, because this is, this is freedom of religion. Well, there's two main court cases that are really important here, and they're both argued in the, at the United States Supreme Court, the court of last appeal, they call it, which means if it doesn't work there, you have no other options. Remember when it, the Lord explained his, his uh, just war theory back in section 98 and 101, and it was all about appealing for your rights uh, and appeal to the judge locally, and then the governor, and then the president. And if that doesn't work, then what are you left with? Well, only God can come through for you. And so, so that was the case. Well, in this one, you can try the local judge. You can try the, the appellate courts. Ultimately, the court of last appeal, last resort, will be the United States Supreme Court. So how's this for a title for a Supreme Court case? Reynolds versus United States. Yeah, that's who you're up against. Now, who's poor George Reynolds? Now, this is 1879, so it's between the Morrill Act and the Edmonds Act. But the church leaders need a test case. They need to kind of push this up the channels so that the United States has to come out and say, is this law constitutional or not? From the Latter-day Saint perspective, it's unconstitutional. And so no wonder we're not going to live it. If you remember, there were some interesting potential loopholes in, in section 134, when it talked about how we feel about church and state and law and so on, section 98, and that law of the land, which is constitutional, supporting that principle of freedom and maintaining rights and privileges, belongs to all mankind and is justifiable before me. So you see what he's saying? Even the next verse even goes on. Therefore, I, the Lord, justify you and your brethren of my church in befriending that law, which is the constitutional law of the land. So in that passage, you really get the sense of, of course we believe in law. Constitutional law, that is. 
If a law is unconstitutional, then no, we shouldn't have to live it. And that's how they felt about the Morrill Act. It's how they felt about the Edmonds Act. It's how they felt about the Edmonds-Tucker Act. It's like those are unconstitutional because they are infringing upon our religious freedoms. They don't have to be lived. This is civil disobedience because a law isn't deemed civil by those that are being called to obey it. Again, we talked about this when we discussed 134. How's this for another legal loophole? 134 verse 5. We believe that all men are bound to sustain and behold the respective governments in which they reside while protected in their inherent and inalienable rights by the laws of such governments. Do you catch the caveat? We should sustain and uphold law as long as the government is protecting our rights? Well, the government isn't. So we shouldn't uphold a law that is unconstitutional. That verse goes on. Sedition and rebellion are unbecoming every citizen, thus protected. Well, we aren't being protected in those inalienable rights. And so it's not sedition, and it's not rebellion on our part. It's simple civil disobedience. That verse goes on. All governments have a right to enact such laws in their own judgments are best calculated to secure the public interest, which is what the government was doing. But how's the verse end? At the same time, however, holding sacred the freedom of conscience. And you're not doing that, United States. You're not doing it. So the law that you've passed is unconstitutional. We're not going to keep it. And in fact, we're going to try to help people avoid the consequences of not keeping it. And so you get people like, like John Taylor himself, president of the church, and a polygamist going into hiding where you can't publicly speak at general conference anymore. You can't be out among the saints. So many Latter-day Saint church leaders, because they're the ones that are typically living plural marriage, that level of sacrifice under the Abrahamic test. They're, all, they're going on the underground so that we don't get caught. Uh, I mean, there's some interesting parallels between those that are fighting against what they consider unconstitutional laws in, about slavery and unconstitutional laws about polygamy. Really interesting, some, some fascinating parallels there. Because as the courts in Utah are trying to get people to testify against their husbands or their fathers to send them to prison, people are, are refusing to do that. They're trying to avoid it any way they can. And so again, one last verse from DNC 134. For the public peace and tranquility, all men should step forward and use their ability in bringing offenders against good laws to punishment. That's part of that honoring, obeying, and sustaining the law we just talked about in the 12th article of faith. But did you catch the adjective and the caveat that it allowed? Well, yeah, we should help people find uh, offenders to good law. It's the unconstitutional ones we're not quite so interested in. Okay, And so what you, what you get during this time period is the saints against the United States government arguing over what's constitutional and what isn't. So in 1879, George Reynolds becomes the, ke the test case. Like, will you go and like admit that you're a polygamist uh, and allow yourself to be <laughs> arraigned in court just so that in hopes that it gets all the way up to the, to the Supreme Court so we can push back and testify these are our religious beliefs. And so it's unconstitutional to stop us from living them. Well, that didn't go quite as well as poor George Reynolds had hoped because the Court of last resort said, polygamy is illegal. And we don't care about your religious beliefs. Now, this is where they have to, where the, where the, the Supreme Court has to be careful. Because they know the First Amendment, too, requires you can't infringe upon religious belief. But then they take that as their loophole and say, ah, well, we're not. We're, you can believe anything you want. You can believe in plural marriage. You just can't practice it. So these laws that we've passed are constitutional because they don't infringe upon religious beliefs. They only channel religious behaviors into things that are, that are moral and that are, that are just. And we can't have this kind of, these crazy harems out in, 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 the, in the Rocky Mountains. Again, they don't understand what, what plural marriage is. Now I do need to point out here that at that moment, the entire Supreme Court was 100% Protestant. There had been a Catholic uh, justice, uh, Roger Taney, uh, that had been appointed by Andrew Jackson, but he died before this court case came. And the reason I point that out is in Catholicism, religious behaviors are really important alongside religious beliefs, whereas Protestantism doesn't have the same 
focus on behaviors. Since it's sola scriptura and sola fide and sola gracia, it's just scripture and it's just faith and it's just grace. Uh, so it's all about our beliefs. And if you have faith in Christ, then you can be saved. But the, sac the Catholics would say, well, what about the sacraments? And you have to be able to live these things. And for the Latter-day Saints, there's a lot of action and activity and religious behaviors and not just religious beliefs. So part of me wonders, it would have been interesting if there, were, if there had been Catholics on the, on the court, pushing back a little bit about but between that, that kind of fake distinction between behaviors and beliefs. But all Protestants defending a Protestant view of unofficially Protestant America, then nope, Latter-day Saints can't do that. And so... George Reynolds goes to jail. So do other Latter-day Saints. A fascinating picture shows uh, a bunch of inmates at the Utah Territorial Prison, the penitentiary. And if you look close enough at the faces, you'll recognize one as none other than George Q. Cannon. Remember the first presidency wearing the black and white stripes. Can you imagine seeing a picture of, oh, President Irene in orange jumpsuit in, in jail? That's the equivalent. I mean, I would say, could you picture President Oaks there? But legal mind, he'd be able to work his way through, <laughs> I'm sure. But first presidency members in prison, prophet in hiding, in intense amount of persecution. And that was only based on the Morrill Act. We'll now add it to the Edmonds Act and then put it on steroids and put it into the Edmonds Tucker Act. And now what are we going to do? If you thought Reynolds versus the United States was an interesting name for a court case, how about this one? From 1890, the year the manifesto was, was announced, the late corporation of the Mormon church versus United States. Whoa, the, the, the late corporation? I mean, that one's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's already confirmed the law as constitutional since it was that law that said, yep, we can disincorporate the church. Uh, they, we can take away all of their property, including the temple that they've been spending the last 37 years building. We can, we can take it all from them. We can dismantle the Mormon church. So no wonder we're going to call this court case the late corporation of the Mormon church versus the United States of America. You've got the nation bearing down on you. And, and there's no escape from that, absent an escape from the nation. Do we, do we pick up and leave all over again? Is this Nauvoo 2.0? Or would that just be Missouri 3.0? Or would that just be Ohio 4.0? Or would that just be New York 5.0? That's all that's ever been happening is us being driven from place to place to place. What are we going to do now? What are we going to do about the temple? What are we going to do about prophets and apostles? And what are we going to do about... People in the church just trying to live their religion. Well, the buck stops with Wilfred Woodruff. Prophet, seer, revelator, president of the church. Well, President Woodruff, what are you going to do? The fact that hap that court case happens in 1890, and the court case was like their last hope, because it's the last resort. And if the court will say, you're right, this is unconstitutional, the church deserves to keep its stuff, then fine, we'll, we just, we'll be able to continue living this way. But we can't. At least we can't here. And we can't now. And we can't anymore. So what do we do? It's, to me, it's ironic that 1890 was also the year, remember when we studied section 130 and Joseph's wrestling with the Lord about the second coming? It's just, please just tell me the day. And the Lord kind of tongue-in-cheek says, well, if you live to be 85, you'll see me. And he's like, oh, does that mean you'll come before I'm 85 or that I'll die before I'm 85? You coming to me or me coming to you? And the Lord's like, hmm, not going to say. Well, what year would Joseph have turned? 85? 1890. This is the year that push comes to shove. And I just wonder if, if Wilfred Woodruff and the saints themselves are like, if I can just hold out till 1890, then Christ comes and the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Christ. The new Jerusalem, we can go back and rebuild it. We can, we can live according to the dictates of our conscience because Christ himself will be here to make sure that's the case. Well, as 1890 is nearing its end, it's not looking like that's the case. A friend of mine once pointed out that they had been studying the journals of Wilford, Wilford Woodruff and even saw that during this time period, 
He even went and dusted off Joseph Smith's old seer stone that had been used to, in the translation of the Book of Mormon. To just, I get a sense from Wilford Woodruff, it's like, Heavenly Father, I need a revelation and I'm desperate and I'll do anything for, for you to tell me what to do. And he even tries the old seer stone that worked for Joseph but didn't work for him. And it's like, I, Heavenly Father, I just need direction. Well, thankfully that direction came. And President Woodruff received clear confirmation that there was one path that he needed to follow. And the church needed to go in this direction. They needed to end the practice of plural marriage. And so he announced that. Again, there is not a written revelation saying, thus saith the Lord. There is a clear confirmation for Wilford Woodruff. This is what you have to do. And so what we have in the official declaration number one is writing, announcing to the world and to the church, this is what we're going to do. And God is behind it. God is in this. We call it the manifesto. And if you look up manifesto in the dictionaries of the day, it's defined as a public declaration, usually of a prince or sovereign, in this case of the president of the church, showing his intentions or proclaiming his opinions and motives. Now, this is far more than an opinion. This is an announcement of revelation. But based on the revelation that I've received to end the practice of plural marriage, I am now manifesting that intention. I am making a manifesto to announce to the world, this is what we're going to do. So let's look at the text itself. To whom it may concern? Well, it concerned all kinds of people. Marriage and family does concern us all. It concerned the Latter-day Saints. It concerned the, the people of the United States. It, con it concerns the people of the world. In fact, that's why governments typically have issued marriage licenses to say your marriage does concern us. Now, in this time period, it concerned the United States intensely. Uh, and for not all the right reasons. Uh, if you read the Journal of Discourses during that time period, so many of the Latter-day Saints would fire back at the Eastern politicians and, and, and press saying, how dare you, how hypocritical of you to try to paint plural marriage into some kind of lascivious love affair when that's exactly what you are doing with your mistresses or your adultery or your, your serial monogamy, they called it, where you get married just so you can get divorced in order to marry somebody else and then divorce them so you can marry somebody else. No, we're taking responsibility for every wife and set of children that we have. These are families and, and social structure and all of those kinds of things that government should care about. We're not doing what you're accusing us of doing. This is, a, this is a different thing here. But to whom it may concern, the irony of this is that now it seems like society has swung the pendulum to the opposite extreme to the point that marriage now doesn't concern anybody. So no-fault divorce, who cares about the stability that a, that a marriage provides for the rising generation? If the, the couple involved don't care to stay together, then who cares what it does to the family? Who cares what it does to the children? Who cares what it does to society itself? Broken homes, broken nations, well, who cares? Uh, the nation isn't going to say anything about the home. It doesn't concern us. Oh, really? Uh, again, we've, we've, over, we've overswung, we've overcorrected. We've lost our collective concern over what forms of family life are most helpful, most stable, most productive of raising children that will be positive members of society. That's why society concerns itself with marriage. It's not just to allow consenting adults to do whatever they want, because that has less to do with collective concern. But raising children, that's huge. Now, to whom it may concern? Press dispatches, having been sent for political purposes from Salt Lake City, which have been widely published to the effect that the Utah Commission, in their recent report to the Secretary of the Interior, allege that plural marriages are still being solemnized and that 40 or more such marriages have been contracted in Utah since last June, or during the past year. Also that in public discourses, the leaders of the church have taught, encouraged, and urged a continuance of the practice of polygamy. Now that's all just an introductory, it's not even a full sentence yet, okay, we just got the dash yet. But that's the intro. 
And what we're seeing there is that press dispatches have come from Salt Lake announcing to the world, the Mormons are still doing it. So all of these laws haven't worked. And, and the threats of imprisonment and of disincorporation and, and, and the Latter-day Saints are still guilty. They haven't stopped. It's, they're still doing what they always have. And so we have to come down hard and we need to take the temples away from them. We need to, to fully enforce what the, the Edmunds Tucker Act said and what the late corporation of the Mormon Church versus the United States said was constitutional. We're going to go through with it. And so those press dispatches are kind of the final, the straw that breaks the camel's back as far as we're dead now. Because that's not even true. But they don't care whether or not it's true. Notice the phrase, they were sent for political purposes. That's all. They're just trying to, to consolidate their power. They're trying to, to beat their chest and flex their muscles so that the LDS church uh, ceases to exist as presently constituted. So up against that, those political press dispatches, what are we going to do? Second paragraph. I, therefore, as president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so here's him establishing his authority, do hereby in the most solemn manner, this isn't for some political purpose, this is solemn decision, declare that these charges are false. Period. It's amazing that the whole intro took you know, a whole paragraph, and this was just one simple sentence. It's not true. Don't trust everything you read on the internet, he would have said if he'd lived in that time period. For that, careful what you're reading in the press, because some things are simply dispatched there for political purposes. So those accusations are false. He goes on, we are not teaching polygamy or plural marriage. So whether it's the name by which you give it or the name that we use, I'm not trying to find some kind of semantic loophole here. We are not teaching it. We're not permitting any person to enter into its practice. And I deny that either 40 or any other number of plural marriages have during that period been solemnized in our temples or in any other place in the territory. Now, that last phrase might be, uh, might be some kind of loophole. It's not in the territory which, where it's illegal. It's not in the United States under the jurisdiction of the Congress and the Supreme Court. Uh, Canada and Mexico, we still don't understand what, what's happening here. We don't, is the second coming right around the corner? Is this end of the exception and back to the rule? Or are we supposed to keep pushing on this? We don't know 100% what's, what's supposed to happen. It's still line upon line, precept upon precept, even for Wilford Woodruff. Again, it's going to be John, uh, Joseph S. Smith that finally clarifies it's completely over for good. Okay. Now, the rest of this language, however, is closing off loopholes left and right, which to me is very bold and, and open and honest of, of President Woodruff. I'm not going to hide behind semantic language. I'm not going to hide behind numbers. Like, oh, no, no, we haven't done 40. That, that's a false report. We did 39. No, we haven't done any, none of it. Not the 40, not any number, not polygamy, not plural marriage. We're not expanding it. We're not teaching it. We're kind of holding steady with marriages that have already been performed and solemnized and being honorable husbands and fathers to the families that we are trying to raise. Well, keep going. Next paragraph. One case has been reported in which the parties allege that the marriage was performed in the endowment house in Salt Lake City in the spring of 1889. So he's trying to be as specific as he can be, but it's something reported. It's just something alleged. We have no proof that that's the case, but notice what he does. But I have not been able to learn who performed the ceremony. Whatever was done in this manner was without my knowledge. And as a result, he says, in consequence of this alleged occurrence, so we don't even know if it happened, but this alleged occurrence, the endowment house was, by my instructions, taken down without delay. Now that's amazing too. Interesting verse in Thessalonians where Paul says to abstain from the appearance of evil. It's not enough to do right. Don't even look like you're doing wrong. And that's what Wilford Woodruff decides to do in that third paragraph. They said, alleged, some suggestion out there that somebody thinks that somebody may have been sealed in a plural marriage in the endowment house. Then let's tear down the whole endowment house, which is serious. I mean, the Salt Lake Temple is still three years away from being finished and dedicated. Uh, but we're not even going to be able to, we will pause even that work uh, to avoid the, the impression that we're doing something wrong, to avoid the appearance of evil. 
in your eyes. Next paragraph, inasmuch as laws have been enacted by Congress forbidding plural marriages, which laws have been pronounced constitutional by the court of last resort. I hereby declare my intention to submit to those laws and to use my influence with the members of the church over which I preside to have them do likewise. So that paragraph lets the church know what he was up against and that there's no more appealing to higher authorities except God himself, which is what he's been trying to do. The, the legislative branch has passed a law which the judicial branch has confirmed as constitutional even though we do not agree with that. Which means the executive branch will now need to enforce the law, which is what these press dispatches are trying to trigger. Come and do it. Come disincorporate. It's the late corporation of the Mormon church. Just end it. Put the horse down. Well, what are we going to do? That was our court of last resort, at least on this side of the veil. So I went to the other side of the veil and pled with God, what are we supposed to do? And what was the decision that I made and the revelation that I received to confirm it? Here's my intention. I'm going to submit to those laws. President Woodruff was a polygamist. I'm not going to abandon any family, but I will not enter into nor allow anyone else to enter into any new plural marriages from this time forward. And I will use my influence. See, this is part of the sustaining the law and not just obeying it. I'll use my influence over the church members that I preside to help them do the same. He then concludes this manifesto, his press dispatch to offset the press dispatches that were being sent for political purposes by saying, there is nothing in my teachings to the church or in those of my associates during the time specified. So he's being really specific here. Of course, I taught plural marriage throughout most of my ministry. It was the law of God. But during the time specified, I stopped doing that waiting to understand the Lord's will, waiting to understand the, the Supreme Court's decision, kind of pause things, hold out, and let's see what comes of this. But I haven't taught anything during that time which can reasonably be construed to inculcate or encourage polygamy. And when any elder of the church has used language which appeared to convey any such teaching, he has been promptly reproved. Reproving betimes with sharpness, well, that was happening there too. Even if it just appears to convey that kind of teaching, we've got to abstain from even the appearance of that. And so I now publicly declare that my advice to the Latter-day Saints is to refrain from contracting any marriage forbidden by the law of the land. Signed, Wilfred Woodruff, President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, like I said, that's still going to be messy because Canada and Mexico are different laws in different lands. And it'll take Joseph F. Smith to, to clarify and confirm that it is over everywhere. But what Wilfred Woodruff is trying to say here, it, to exercise his influence as president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is we're going to obey this law. And then Lorenzo Snow, the next paragraph, offers the following. He's president of the Quorum of the Twelve, after all, the second senior apostle. I move that recognizing Wilfred Woodruff as the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the only man on the earth at the present time who holds the keys of the sealing ordinances, we consider him fully authorized by virtue of his position to issue the manifesto which has been read in our hearing, and which is dated September 24, 1890, and that as a church in general conference assembled, we accept this declaration concerning plural marriages as authoritative and binding. They then presented that to the saints assembled at General Conference, and the vote to sustain the foregoing motion was unanimous. Salt Lake City, Utah, October 6th, 1890. So there you have it. It's interesting the language that President Snow uses there. We recognize President Woodruff as what? As president of the church. He is our presiding our authority, the senior apostle prophet, seer, revelator. We, we understand and recognize him as the only one who holds the keys of the sealing ordinance. And since a, a, a temple sealing requires that key, then of course he has the right to stop it because he has the key to turn off the ignition, which is exactly what he's deciding to do. You see, it's by virtue of his position that he can 
issue this manifesto. It's by virtue of his authority that he can turn off the sealing key. It's by virtue of his position as president of the church that he can receive a revelation that applies to everyone in it. You see what it boils down to here is the position, not the person or personal preference or politics of Wilfred Woodruff, but position as president of the church, as prophet, seer, and revelator. Now, even with that, this was hard for many saints to accept. Now, like I said, for some, this was the best news ever, and they were ready to abandon families, which President uh, Woodruff said, absolutely not. Others, this was the hardest, this was as difficult a test of faith as starting the practice had been for their parents or grandparents. This was, this was a hard thing for them to wrap their hearts around, a hard saying, who can hear it? There had been some benefits to the practice of plural marriage. Many sisters felt such autonomy and freedom because not all of them had the same responsibilities. And it's with sister wives, it could be, oh, well, you're so good with children. Will you care for mine while I go back east and get an education so I can be a doctor or a, a nurse or a school teacher, an artist, whatever it might be? And they did. There was greater distribution of wealth. Uh, as often poor people could, be, could join larger families and, and, and combine pool resources and so on. It, ironically, the divorce laws were pretty liberal. It was pretty easy to get a divorce in Pioneer, Utah, because they realized how hard a marriage was. And Brigham Young was very open with, if this isn't working, believe me, there's always other options. Even if they're already taken, they're not fully taken. Uh, talk about pressure to be a good husband, right? Uh, but when this revelation came and then this official declaration was manifested, for a lot of people it was a real trial, trial of faith. So that left Wilfred Woodruff and others to go around among the saints and continue to confirm to them this really is revelation and the will and mind of God. And more than just me receiving that revelation, I want you to receive that revelation too. It was Brigham Young who had said that he was worried about people just taking the prophet's word for it and never doing any thinking for themselves. And so there was always that encouragement, gain a testimony to confirm the, the testimony that I've given. And that's one of the things that the rest of what we have here in the official declaration uh, it gives us. This is not the manifesto itself, but as you see here on the page, these were excerpts from three addresses by President Wilford Woodruff regarding the manifesto. The first one is just that one paragraph you see at the beginning. This is still at that general conference where it was announced. And in this discourse, President Woodruff said this very famous statement. The Lord will never permit me or any other man who stands as president of this church to lead you astray. It's not in the program. It's not in the mind of God. If I were to attempt that, the Lord would remove me out of my place. And so he will any other man who attempts to lead the children of men astray from the oracles of God and from their duty. Now we've seen several times in the Doctrine and Covenants where the Lord tells even Joseph himself, no one's irreplaceable. And if you're not faithful, you will be removed and someone else will be called to take your place. So again, here's Wilfred Woodruff saying something similar. God will not allow the prophet to lead the church astray. But I could picture a skeptic saying, well, wait a minute, that's just circular logic. That's you, you telling me to trust you because you can always be trusted. No, I need an outside authority before I step into that circular logic. Okay, fine. That's what the next set of, uh, of statements is for. And I love this one. I mean, that first excerpt is really good because it's so simple and straightforward. I think that's why we quote it all the time. But I think it's much more powerful what he says in this second one. It's longer. It's at a state conference that he gives in 1891. So this is a whole year has passed and you can sense that this is still a struggle for Latter-day Saints because President Woodruff is still talking about it and confirming that this is the Lord's will for you. I wasn't just throwing out something to the press or to the politicians to, to get them off our trail. No, I know this is what God wants us to do. I mean, you'll see elsewhere, it's not here, but elsewhere, Wilfred Woodruff talks about, you really think I'm going to go against plural marriage just to save myself when I'm not going to be here much longer? I'm near the end of my life. And when I die, guess who I'll see? Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, people that were willing to do anything and everything to do the will of God. Am I going to be the weak link in that chain? 
You think I'm going to show my face to them and said, sorry, I cowed to political pressure. Uh, I couldn't handle it. No, that was not Wilford Woodruff. And so for him to talk a year later with people at state conference up in Logan and help them see something, this wasn't just him saying, I know it's true. And since I'm the prophet, you got to trust me. Or since I'm the prophet, God won't let me lead the church astray. What I say just has to be his will. No, he does something so much better than that. So much higher, so much holier, and so much more inclusive than, than, than that. So notice what he says here. I love this second excerpt. It matters not who lives or who dies or who is called to lead the church. So it's not about me. They have got to lead it by the inspiration of Almighty God. If they do not do it that way, they cannot do it at all. So it's God's way or it's no way. This is his church. It is led by revelation. So he says, I have had some revelations of late and very important ones to me. And I will tell you what the Lord has said to me. Let me bring your minds to what is termed the manifesto. So in that brief paragraph, you get to see the differentiation between the manifesto, which is an official declaration and the revelations, plural, that he had received, very important ones to him, that led up to the manifesto. So what I love about this is what we just studied was the announcement, the official declaration. Now what Wilfred Woodruff is going to invite us into is the revelation that preceded and precipitated it. And here's what he says, third paragraph. The Lord has told me to ask the Latter-day Saints a question. This is part of his revelation. And he also told me that if they would listen to what I said to them and answer the question put to them by the spirit and power of God, they would all answer alike and they would all believe alike with regard to this matter. Now, I'm amazed at the confidence in that statement. And no wonder he has it. It came from the Lord. And so the Lord revealing to Wilfred Woodruff, if they're not sure about it, then have them ask the same question that you are asking. Because if they have the same question and they're asking the same source, then guess what? They'll get the same answer. I shared, a, I can't even remember when, but in a previous lesson, this incredible experience I had on my mission with this couple that was ready to be baptized, had the uh, baptismal interview, and the wife was asked if she'd ever participated in an abortion. Because that's a significant enough sin that it needs to be resolved with a higher priesthood authority than, than a mere missionary. Well, it turns out that she had. Uh, years before, when she was young and, and didn't really understand the consequences, and she was devastated about it. But her husband was even more devastated for her sake. And I remember when we just kind of gently asked, oh, this is something that is beyond us. We'll, we're going to need to call our mission president. Would, is that okay with you if we call and explain the situation? Because he'll need to set up an appointment to talk so that you can work through that as far as the repentance process is concerned. She seemed okay to do it, but her husband absolutely not. And he was so mad. He's like, how dare you drag my wife through this? She's clean. She's forgiven. That is ancient history. Don't make her go through this again. Don't dredge up these painful memories. And I didn't know what to do, but it was the weirdest thing to hear myself respond. One of those open your mouth. I didn't even open it. It just opened and came out because when he said she's clean, she's forgiven. I just said bolder than I ever thought I would. How do you know? And then I'm like, oh boy, okay, now he's going to be mad at me. And he was taken aback. We all were like, uh, like I'm calling him out. But I asked, how do you know your wife is clean? How do you know she's been forgiven? How do you know she's repented? And it, I guess the, the jolt and the boldness calmed him down for a second, at least it forced him to pause. And he's gathered his thoughts and he said, because I just, I just know my wife. I know the kind of person she is. I know... I trust in the forgiveness that comes from God. I can just, I just feel it. And then to reassure him, I said, I agree with you, okay? I didn't ask that question. I didn't want to. I didn't ask that question to, ca to cast doubt. In some ways, I, I think I asked it to have you really consider where is this sense of, of forgiveness coming from? And then I asked him another question that I thought was weird. I just said, how many Holy Ghosts are there? And he was like, huh? My companion's all, huh? And I'm like, huh? What kind of weird question is that? And he's like, well, one? I'm like, exactly. 
So I'm just asking this, if there's only one Holy Ghost, and if you asked a question and got an answer from that one Holy Ghost, then if my mission president asks the same question with the same information, won't he get the same answer? Since there's only one Holy Ghost? Can you trust that? If you're confident enough in your answer, can you have confidence that the same Spirit will give the same answer to my mission president? And very humbly, this good man said, yes, I do trust my answer. And I trust his inspiration to get the same one. And I was like, Phew, okay, good. That, that Defuse that bomb. Well, unbeknownst to me, is the sequel to the story. I called the mission president and said, here's our situation. We need to set up an appointment for you to interview this sister for baptism and so on. And I didn't tell him about the only one <laughs> Holy Ghost conversation. But my mission president said, uh, Elder Halverson, how do you feel about it? Do you feel like she's repentant? Do you feel like she's ready for baptism? And it was so interesting that it was like he was calling me out for the thing I had just done with her, with her and her husband. And as I had my own little gut check and, and asked the same spirit, the same question, I did feel the same answer. And so I said to my mission president, I really do feel like she is repentant and that she is clean and that she's ready to be baptized. And my mission president then said, good, I do too. Then baptize her. And I remember thinking, well, you're not even going to interview her? And it's like, in some ways I already did. Through you and through him and through her and through the Holy Ghost, it's only the same one for us all. I feel just as good about this as you do. So move forward with faith. And what I love about this brief paragraph there is that Wilfred Woodruff is doing the same thing. He's showing so much confidence in his own revelation and maybe even better, confidence that the members of the church can receive the same one. I'm amazed by that. I trust God and his ability to give me revelation and to give you revelation. So I'm going to leave the two of you to discuss this. That's amazing to me. And I have enough faith in the process to just let it unfold naturally and spiritually. You see what he just did? He cracked open the, the accusation of circular reasoning from the first excerpt. Okay, fine. It isn't just me. It isn't just take my word for it. Let me introduce two other parties to this circle. And it's you and it's God. Because this wasn't just me making up my mind. It was me pleading with God and God confirming the truth, revealing his will. And if you come, step into the same circle, you'll get the same answer. You just have to ask the same question. Now, here's what I need to pause here for a second, because I, I, like I said, I can't even remember where I taught this, shared this story and taught this principle earlier. But one of you amazing viewers reached out and said, but wait a minute, does that mean I can never get a revelation that, that's different than the prophet? Uh, and the specifics they were talking about was the mask mandate, which is interesting. I'm not going to get into the details of that uh, medically and, and politically, because it's become a huge political issue, probably even more than a medical issue for a lot of people. And so I don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole, but I will touch it with this. What question are you asking, and who are you asking for? Because the prophet is asking the question on behalf of the entire church and world. And chances are you're asking the question, at least you should be asking the question, for you and, forever, and for whomever you have stewardship for. The way revelation works is I can't receive revelation for somebody else's stewardship. I can for me and for my stewardship. But who's in the prophet's stewardship? The big picture. So in some ways, can there be exceptions to rules? Yes. But what is the prophet's responsibility? Determining the rule. What's your responsibility? Determining if you are an exception. And not in terms of, let's change the rule. That's not your responsibility. It's not your stewardship. But am I an exception to this one? Because if the prophet changes the rule across the board, that might have different ramifications, different consequences than me just knowing that in my circumstance, I'm supposed to do this instead of that or, or vice versa. I hope this is making sense. I, I don't want to open a can of worms here, but at the same time, I need to honor people that have, it's like, I think I've talked about this before, about abortion and divorce. 
There are exceptions to that. We're against abortion and we're against divorce, but there are exceptions to that. Elder Oaks has talked about those exceptions, but they're not going to preach that there's no rule because then everybody feels like they're the exception. And society will fall apart if abortion and divorce becomes the new rule instead of a very narrow exception to a rule that, that ap applies in the vast number of situations. I, I have a feeling that something similar can be said about mask mandates and vaccines and other, these other kinds of things. Ask the same question as the prophet, which would namely be not just what should I do for my own circumstance. Your health, your, your situation, you need to ponder your own specifics. But the prophet isn't given that luxury. The prophet has to think for the, has to think for the whole. The prophet has to decide rules. And I don't want that pressure. They didn't ask for it either. But Wilfred Woodruff was feeling that pressure. Not just, should I just go into hiding and keep on practicing plural marriage and teaching it and so on? It's what will be the outcome for the entire church? With pandemics and things, what will be the outcome for the entire human race or for the nation or for the church? The prophet has authority on all three of those levels. I, I hope this is making sense and I hope that if you are an exception, I've said this to my students before, you can disagree with a prophet in your individual circumstances. However, I would just push you to ask yourself this, have I done the same amount of homework on this issue that they did? With the same level of conversation partners as they did? Am I living as consecrated a life as they are to receive the kind of spiritual manifestations that they do? Because if I'm an exception and I know it from God, then I have no one's judgment to fear, including the prophets. He would say, you paid that price and you got that answer, then go with it. But would you, would you ask everyone else in the church or the world to do it your way? Because that's where you need to pause and reconsider. I've been asking for all of us. And this is the Lord's answer for the collective whole. I will then honor your agency. If you can find yourself able to honor my responsibility. Now, what's the question that you're supposed to ask? And it's a collective question. He says it in the fourth paragraph. The question is this, which is the wisest course for the Latter-day Saints to pursue? You catch the collective nature of the question. I'm not asking for that one brother that lives in, in San Pete County. I'm not asking for this, the specific family that's up here in Cache Valley. I'm asking for the Latter-day Saints as a whole. What should be our general policy here? What's the wisest course for us to pursue? To continue to attempt to practice plural marriage? So there's option one. And what's the situation like? Well, with the laws of the nation against it and the opposition of 60 millions of people, okay, that's what we're up against. And then here's what the consequences of option one would be. At the cost of the confiscation and loss of all the temples, I mean, by now they're 38 years into the construction of the Salt Lake Temple, but the St. George Temple is done and the Manti Temple is done and the Logan Temple, which is where this state conference is taking place, is done. So the loss of all the temples, and as a result, the stopping of all the ordinances therein, both for the living and the dead. And I'm serious, we'd have to do it. I took down the endowment house. Would we take down the temples too? The imprisonment of the first presidency and 12 and the heads of families in the church, because that's been taking place already. And the confiscation of personal property of the people, all of which of themselves would stop the practice. So in some ways, there's not even a choice in this choice. It's going to stop one way or another. Or here's option two, after doing and suffering what we have through our adherence to this principle. So knowing what we've done to show God that we are serious about obedience, that we will do anything he asks us to do. If we have gathered the sticks and assembled the altar and laid Isaac upon it and sharpened our stone and raised it over his head, can the hand be stayed? Have we done enough? 
after all of that, here's the other option, to cease the practice and submit to the law. And what would the consequences of that one be? And through doing so, leave the prophets, apostles, and fathers at home so that they can instruct the people and attend to the duties of the church and also leave the temples in the hands of the saints so that they can attend to the ordinances of the gospel, both for the living and the dead. You see how he's setting up this question, how he asked it himself, how he's asking them to ask it. It's amazing as far as how to come up with or how to make decisions ourselves, how to come up with the right solution to problems. Weigh the options. Understand the circumstances. See what you've done in your past and what the results of each decision will be in your future. I mean, this is te textbook model of how to, how to make up your mind on things. And through it all, seeking the Lord's guidance and inspiration through the process, this is beautiful. Now, before we get to the answer in the next paragraph, I do want to point out one other thing in, this, in the question paragraph. And it's as he lists things, like what would happen if we, if we kept practicing plural marriage? He has this whole list of things, most of which have already happened. There's just a few of which that can still be uh, avoided if they, if they choose a certain path. And that to me speaks volumes about what really, really matters to God and to his servants. Because he brings up, we're going to be punished by the nation. These laws are against us. But then they could say, well, we've, we've been punished by the nation repeatedly for decades. Okay, well, we can handle that then. How about the next one? We're going to be blasted by popular opinion. 60 million people are going to be against us. And they're like, well, they already are. And we've never cared about popular opinion. We've never cared what people think. It's like, okay, good. So that's not, that's not a deal breaker. How about the next one? How about imprisonment of the First Presidency or the Twelve or the heads of families? Again, they'd say, we've, we've let that happen too. You've seen the pictures of George Q. Cannon there in stripes. Uh, we, we, we can handle that. Okay, then how about the confiscation of personal property of the people? And again, they'll say, we're lo losing things left and right. We're losing our power to vote. We're losing our property. We're losing, uh, I mean, I, it's hard to run a business when you can't show up to work. Uh, it's hard to run your farm when you're in hiding. We're willing to go through with all of that. We've proven it. We've already done those things. So why are you even bringing them up? And I think Wilfred Woodruff would say, to point out the ones that, that we haven't yet done. Uh, to, you have proven your willingness to sacrifice so many things. And you've proven that, those, that, that the, the obedience to the laws of God are non-negotiables to you. Well, let me introduce two other possibilities that are going to really force the question upon us. Number one, the temple. Are you willing to live plural marriage at the, at the expense of the temples? And number two, which is like unto it, are you willing to stop performing ordinances for the living and the dead? Because those are two things that we haven't had to do yet. But if we keep practicing plural marriage, we will. It's been interesting for me to watch oh, denominational divides dissolve in the face of, of lowered numbers. As you see a lot of Protestant denominations, for example, struggling, losing members, some of them have consolidated and you have congregations that are kind of a hybrid between different denominations that existed before, or you see more and more non-denominational Christian churches out there. Uh, and that's a, a huge development in the last several decades. Well, fewer and fewer First Baptists and Second Methodists and a whole lot more uh, the Cornerstone Church or Lifeway or just things of, that, that are kind of vague and you don't really know what denomination it is. And you go there and you still can't really tell what denomination. It's just non-denominational Christian. That's it. Well, why haven't, how hasn't it always been that way? Well, because denominational divides suggested disagreements. We don't agree with you on the manner of baptism. We don't agree with you on the points of doctrine. We don't agree with you on the ecclesiology and how the church should run. And the fact that those dividing lines are disappearing lets you know that those points of distinction or dispute somehow have had to be compromised or ignored, just looked pat, negotiated is the word which then forces you to wrestle with what are the non-negotiables? 
It's like, no, we can't combine with that church because we won't budge on this particular doctrine. You understand what I'm saying here? Uh, to me, it's really interesting that when things get hard and you're making compromises because you have to, it really forces you to grapple with what are my non-negotiables. Uh, you, you might have a list of the things you're looking for in, in your spouse, and then you actually meet a living person, and nobody's going to live up to all of those. Well, then you really start questioning, and, uh, well, which ones are my non-negotiables? Versus, yeah, that one doesn't really matter, because he or she has this, and that one has to be there. That one, its absence would be a deal breaker. So what I'm getting at here is the saints are learning their deal breakers. They're coming to grips with what are the real non-negotiables. Am I willing to give up some of my personal freedoms over this? Yeah. Am I willing to let prophets and apostles even have to go into hiding? Yeah. Am I willing to lose the temple over this? Am I willing to stop salvation for the living and the dead? What was the point of plural marriage anyway? It was to help us live a consecrated life. It was to push us into, into realms of consecration and sacrifice and obedience that would lead to exaltation. But none of that's even possible without temples and work for the living and the dead that takes place there. Who cares about keeping that covenant if no one else can even make it? And what I love about this manifesto what I love about all the persecution the saints went through during those anti-polygamy legislation years, and what I love about the way Wilfred Woodruff is asking the question of God and asking them to do the same, is it forces us to realize that the great non-negotiables are the work of God, the house of God, turning hearts of fathers and children to one another. This is God's New and everlasting covenant. Not just a subset of it called plural marriage, but the big umbrella, the new and everlasting covenant of God to his children. I'm going to bring you all home, and the only way to do that is through the temple. It's where I tie up every loose end. It's how I help you become like me. Plural marriage has been a means to that greater end, but this is the greater end. And if that means is now getting in the way of the end, then the means has to go. I'm not trying to destroy the law. I'm trying to fulfill it. I'm not trying to dismantle the law of Moses. I'm trying to fulfill its purpose through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that plural marriage was wrong, but if you keep living it in the face of people who are adamant that it is, then they're going to stop the work that is most right in all of this. So let it go. Step away from the law of Moses and come into the gospel of Jesus Christ. It hasn't been destroyed. Live eternal marriage according to the rule that's always been there, which is monogamy. You have passed your test at proving your ob obedience to one of the most gut-wrenching exceptions to the rule imaginable. Now the fifth paragraph, here was his answer. And it will be theirs if they ask the same question. The Lord showed me by vision and revelation. So this is vision and revelation behind the official declaration. Exactly what would take place if we did not stop this practice. If we had not stopped it, you would have had no use for any of the men in this temple at Logan. He's right there at state conference. For all ordinances would be stopped throughout the land of Zion. Confusion would reign throughout Israel. I mean, without prophets and apostles uh, in front of the saints to teach them, then the confusion, of, of course, would reign. Many men would be made prisoners. This trouble would come upon the whole church, and we should have been compelled to stop the practice. Now the question is whether it should be stopped in this manner or in the way the Lord has manifested to us. And leave our prophets and apostles and fathers free men, and the temples in the hands of the people, so that the dead may be redeemed. A large number has already been delivered from the prison house in the spirit world by this people. And shall the work go on or stop? This is the question I lay before the Latter-day Saints. You have to judge for yourselves. 
I want you to answer it for yourselves. I shall not answer it. But I say to you that this is exactly the condition we as a people would have been in had we not taken the course we have. That is such a profound paragraph. What is the ultimate non-negotiable? The work of God. His work and his glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. How do we do that? Anything else shy of that might be able to be adjusted. But how do we perform God's saving work? How do we continue to engage in it? Shall the work go on or stop? Remember Joseph's great statement, no unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. Or all of those exclamation points back in section 128. Shall we not go on in such a cause? Courage, brethren, and on, on to the victory. Move forward. Do the work of God. And don't worry about what so some things might have to stop so that other things will never have to. He then says in the next paragraph, I saw exactly what would come to pass if there was not something done. I have had this spirit upon me for a long time. This was not a hasty decision. I've been thinking about this for a long time. We'll see the same thing is true of the revelation about race and the priesthood. Decades have gone into contemplating, pondering these things. But then he says this, and it's an amazing statement. But I want to say this, I should have let all the temples go out of our hands. I should have gone to prison myself and let every other man go there, had not the God of heaven commanded me to do what I did do. And when the hour came that I was commanded to do that, it was all clear to me. I went before the Lord and I wrote what the Lord told me to write. And that was that manifesto. So even in the official declaration, there was revelation. It's just that all the revelation that preceded it was what enabled him to write what he wrote. We're doing this thing. <sighs> against the odds, against decades of pushing back and holding firm. I mean, the way he describes it there, it's such a powerful ending of this excerpt. In spite of all those those consequences, even what we consider the non-negotiable ones. See this, I want, to, I want to back up from what I said, just a, just a touch. Because there, Wilfred Woodruff says, I would have done it. You mean even the temple is negotiable ultimately? Well, if God so commands. Even his work is negotiable? Well, I don't know how he would do it otherwise, but... I trust his omnipotence and his omniscience. I trust him. So that second to last paragraph is what finally lets us know the ultimate non-negotiable. The preliminary non-negotiable was the, the work of God, but the true non-negotiable is the will of God. And that's where Wilfred Woodruff leaves them and us. What does God want us to do? I'll do anything if he's asking me even the things i never thought i would do or could do or should do i'll do I'll, I'll follow the will of god he then closes i leave this with you for you to contemplate and consider the lord is at work with us such confidence in himself in god in the people so i'll leave it with you contemplate it consider it I think that that invitation extends out through time, by the way, to include you and me, that we can contemplate and consider these things as well. Now, the third and very brief excerpt is at the end. This is from the dedication of the Salt Lake Temple. So another year and a half has passed, April of 1893, still on people's minds. And what does President Woodruff say? Now, I will tell you what was manifested to me and what the Son of God performed in this thing. Notice who gets the credit. The Son of God is performing something here. He's doing his work in his way. He's the one making this final difficult decision. All these things would have come to pass as God Almighty lives had not that manifesto been given. Therefore, the Son of God felt disposed to have that thing presented to the church and to the world for purposes in his own mind. You see, with that, President Woodruff is even suggesting, I don't even know all the reasons, but I trust that God does. The Son of God is performing something in this thing. 
He had plans. He felt disposed. He had purposes in his own mind. And I trust that. So he says, the Lord had decreed the establishment of Zion. That's something he's sticking to. He had decreed the finishing of this temple, which he's allowed us to do. He had decreed that the salvation of the living and the dead should be given in these valleys of the mountains. And it's happening, has ever since. And Almighty God decreed that the devil should not thwart it. If you can understand that, that is the key to it. I love that final key. What the last thing Wilfred Woodruff says, God has made sure that the devil will not win. So whether the devil is manifest through our own weakness and humanity and fallenness, whether it's manifest through outside opposition or persecution, the Lord refuses to lose the ultimate battle. Think back, this is 1890 uh, and plus. Go back to 1829. And as the Doctrine and Covenants begins... The Book of Mormon is not even finished being translated yet, but the 116 pages have been. And then it's lost. And what do we do from here? Go back to section 10. And what did the Lord reassure Joseph Smith with? He told him, On this wise the devil has sought to lay a cunning plan, that he may destroy this work. Did he think he was doing something similar in attacking the saints' religious freedom? Well, later in section 10, the Lord says, I will not suffer that they shall destroy my work. Yea, I will show unto them that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. Behold, they have only got a part, an abridgment of the account of Nephi. I almost picture the Lord kind of chuckling there going, <laughs> I had two copies and they stole the wrong one. The one that's still left to be translated is the far more important of the two. And in some ways, it's almost like if the adversary is trying to take down the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, to, in, to disincorporate it, the, the late corporation of the Mormon Church, <laughs> they took aim at the wrong thing. I mean, they were close. They took aim at marriage and family, and that's really, really important to the plan. But plural marriage was always the exception anyway. And as long as the temple is there, as long as the work can continue, as long as prophets and apostles with sealing keys are present. Oh, the devil, they brought down the wrong thing. He, the, the, um, the larger umbrella still holds, even if we had to collapse that little one. I was going to collapse it someday anyway. I mean, who knows? <laughs> Maybe it was allowed to stay that long just to give the adversary some, some lesser targets. I don't know. Uh, what Wilfred Woodruff didn't know it all either. <laughs> I love what he says. It's purposes in God's own mind. And I'm okay with that. During the same time period, in fact, George Q. Cannon, <laughs> Mr. Territorial Penitentiary himself, said this, the presidency of the church have to walk just as you walk. They have to take steps just as you take steps. They have to depend upon the revelations of God as they come to them. They cannot see the end from the beginning, as the Lord does. All that we can do is to seek the mind and will of God. And when that comes to us, though it may come in contact with every feeling that we have previously entertained, we have no option but to take the step that God points out and to trust to Him. I can't think of a better way to summarize the history of the church, really. Of line upon line and precept upon precept and and just struggling to balance agency with inspiration and, and come to an understanding of the will of God. We are all reaching upward into that third shelf and hoping that God in his mercy will send some things down to the second, including prophets and apostles. I get that sense from this very humble, but very inspired and directed president, Wolfert Woodruff. The same will hold true with what we turn to now in the second official declaration about race and the priesthood and all the change that was required through that and all the slow line upon line increase of understanding that took place to get us to that point. Before I, I start there, though, I want to say one last thing about change in general as we stand kind of bridging the gap between the change of plural marriage and the change of priesthood. And to me, the, one of the best places to study this is in 3 Nephi chapter 15. 
because Jesus is there among the Nephites. In chapter 11, he descends, and then in 12, 13, 14, he preaches to them the sermon at the, at the temple, which in the, among the Jews had been the Sermon at the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount was, was interesting in terms of changes that were, that were made. As Jesus says, I've hinted at it already, I came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. So the law says don't kill. I say don't even get angry. The law says don't commit adultery. I say don't even look with lust. The law says this, I say this. And there's all these, these changes, especially when it comes to the law of Moses. Now it's even more apparent when you get to the Nephites because the atonement is now done. And so no more animal sacrifice. Now you need to offer a broken heart and a contrite spirit. No more law of Moses. Now we're fully entering into the dispensation of the gospel of Christ. And so if it was confusing for the Jews in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it was even more confusing for the Nephites in 35, 12, 13, 14. Now, they'd been prepared for this. Uh, Nephi early on talks about this in 2 Nephi 25, that just trust what Jesus says. Whatever he says is the most important thing. And all this other stuff is just preliminary and, and anticipatory. We're trying to prepare for the real sacrifices of, of self. But when Jesus gets there, and having just taught that sermon, 3 Nephi 15 begins with everyone kind of freaking out <laughs> about change. What does this mean? And I picture the saints feeling the same thing in 1890, and I feel the, the similar thing with the saints feeling it in 1978, and maybe you felt it when we did away with home teaching and visiting teaching and did ministering instead. Maybe you felt it with a change from three-hour to two-hour church. Maybe you felt it with a change in mission age or approach with preach my gospel or Whatever it might be or whatever might yet be, one constant is change, right? Well, 3 Nephi 15 says this, It came to pass that when Jesus had said these words, he perceived that there were some among them, so not everybody, but some, who marveled and wondered what he would concerning the law of Moses. For they understood not the saying that old things had passed away and that all things had become new. So they're the ones scratching their head going, wait a minute, we've been doing this other thing for like 1,200 years. We're just going to scrap it now? What? Well, here's an interesting exercise. Study the next oh, 10 verses or so and look for what does change, but look more carefully for what doesn't change. And I love how the Lord walks them through this. I talked about this last year in the video for 3 Nephi 15, if you want to get a little cheat sheet from there. But it's interesting to look and see what is constant amidst the changes. Things like the need for obedience and endurance, that hasn't changed. Or the need for prophets to guide the way, that hasn't changed. Or per, for prophecies and promises, they're still in effect. Or the covenant is mentioned several times in that passage, it's still in place. Best of all, I am the light and the law. The light is still on and the law is still in effect because I'm the law giver. Why did you call it the law of Moses all those years? It came from me. It was a preliminary law of Christ and now I'm giving you the fulfillment in the gospel of Christ. But did you hear the constant? Christ, me. I told you what to do then. I'm telling you what to do now. So just follow me. That's all Wilfred Woodruff is trying to do. It's all Joseph Smith did. It's all Brigham Young did. It's all John Taylor did. And even in their imperfect ways, struggling and trying and, and reaching for the will of God, that's what they were always after. Not my will, but his be done. And that hasn't changed with a manifesto. In fact, even if you just think of the specifics from, no pl from plural marriage to no, actually from no plural marriage to plural marriage to no plural marriage again, what are the constants? Well, the law of chastity for one. We saw that back in 132. The law of obedience for another. The law of sacrifice for a third. In fact, think about where we're most familiar with those three laws. Whether you're living plural marriage or post-manifesto period, Will you obey? Will you sacrifice? Will you be chaste? Next, what else doesn't change through all of this? The importance of the family. It looks a little different, not before or after, but the family with parents and children and creation, all of those things is still the core. 
How about the importance of priesthood keys? That hasn't changed. One person turning them in one direction, another turning them in another. But the keys, the keys are still there. How about the importance of prophetic guidance? A prophet, seer, and revelator with their hand upon the helm. That hasn't changed. How about the importance of the temple? It was important before. It's, it still holds true important to this day. Actually, I guess that one makes me wonder. Because the book of Revelation says that someday there'll be no, there's no temples in the celestial kingdom. We don't need them. The whole, the whole kingdom is the temple. It's the house of God because it's the kingdom of God. And I guess in a similar way, maybe prophets aren't necessary either because they're part of the scaffolding that can come down once the building is constructed. So I guess that really does force us back to the real question. What is the building that all the scaffolding is for? It's the eternal family. And someday when the eternal family of God stands complete, then temples will have served their purpose. Then prophets will have served their purpose. Then everything else will have served their purpose because what does it boil down to? The ultimate, last, final, true, non-negotiable. The work and will of God, which namely is to exalt the family of God, to make sure that we are all brought back to their presence. That, in some ways, introduces the second official declaration beautifully. Because there was a portion of God's children that had been cut off from that full participation. And, and God was, was changing things to bring them fully into his embrace with priesthood and temple blessings and eternal family ceilings and everything else that God had always promised his children. Now this one might be even trickier than the plural marriage one. Because with plural marriage, at least we have section 132 to go on as far as how things were begun. And yet even that's tricky because there were things Joseph understood that preceded that revelation that puts it put down in print. So the beginnings of things can sometimes still be a little nebulous. And that's definitely the case when it comes to the restriction on priesthood. Now let me back up and give a little more history here. The, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the statement of Martin Luther King Jr., whose name is synonymous with, with racial equality and its absence. And the incredible sacrifices that good men and women of multiple races did, but especially our African-American brothers and sisters, to try to, to push humanity into a place of greater equality. The great Martin Luther King Jr. said, it is appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. You understand what he's hinting at? What usually happens around 11 o'clock on Sunday morning? Church. And so what he sees as appalling is a bunch of fellow Christians that can't get along because of some kind of outward distinctions based on the color of our skin. That is appalling. Thankfully, even through the years of race restriction on priesthood, there was no race restriction on membership in the church. And we have never had segregated congregations at 11 a.m. in the morning. There have been linguistic wards and stakes to be able to allow people to worship in their own language. But as far as race is concerned, I, I am for one, am grateful that as the Presbyterians, Methodists, and Baptists, the three largest and fastest growing denominations, the Protestant denominations in America, pre-Civil War, all three split over the slave issue. The Latter-day Saints did not. With prophetic guidance, you can't. There is one prophet, seer, and revelator. Uh, and then what, and how are we supposed to navigate this? What are we supposed to do? Well, to see how Joseph Smith tried to navigate things and how Brigham Young tried to navigate things. And then fast forward, especially how David O. McKay and Spencer W. Kimball tried to navigate things. Uh, I do see the hand of God through this, even as they're wrestling and trying to make sense of, of living up to, the, to God's divine expectation of oneness in the family of humanity. Now, let me back up with two quick stories. When I was in Tennessee, being asked by all kinds of groups to come and explain Mormonism, one was an invitation from a religion professor at Tennessee State University. 
and he called and said, hey, I'm doing a class this semester on American religious history. I hear you're a Latter-day Saint at the Divinity School. Will you come over and lecture on Mormonism for one of my class periods? I said, I'd be happy to. How long is the class? And he said, two hours. I said, awesome. What do you want me to cover? And he said, oh, you know, I mean, your doctrine, your practice, your, your, your theology, your, your history. And I was like, you're only giving me two hours here. I'm going to have to be selective. Uh, you all know how long I can go on Mormonism, right? Uh, so I said, is there anything more specific you really want me to cover? And he's like, no, whatever you feel is most important for us to know. Now, I knew something about Tennessee State University. It belongs, it's an HBCU institution, as in a historically black college or university. And knowing that, I just wanted to ask this professor, are you sure there's not anything more specific than just LDS general, generalities that you want me to hit? And he kept kind of avoiding the issue by saying, no, no, whatever you feel is important. And then I said, okay, great. Believe me, I can fill two hours on, on, on my church. Which, so let me ask it this way. Is there anything by the end of the two hours that if I didn't cover, you would feel some regret over? Okay, I just put it that way. Anything, I'll fill the two hours and it'll be things I think are important. But I need to know what you think is most important. And then he said, well, now that you mention it, I'm sure some of our students would be interested to know about the history of race in your church. And I smiled. I said, okay, that I, God, we're on the same page. I assumed that would be the case. Well, I assumed it, but I underestimated it. Because when I got there, and I actually put out this kind of PowerPoint to get, that I put together that was more interactive in terms of, here's like 10 different things we could talk about in the church. So uh, kind of a little bit more student directed. What are you interested in learning? And so after kind of presenting really briefly, here's a bunch of possibilities where we, we, where we could go. I asked, so what, what are you interested in? And this one girl raises her hand. I was the only non-African-American in the room. She raised her hand and just said, I want to talk about race in the history of your church. I said, awesome. We can definitely do that. Uh, anyone else have anything from the menu that, that you'd like to talk about as well? And nothing. <laughs> uh, crickets. And I was like, oh, okay. So everybody in here, that's all you want to talk about is race in the history of Mormonism? And they're like, yep. I said, all righty. Well, this is going to be a fun two hours. And for the next two hours, we just talked about the racial history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It was actually a powerful experience. Now, couple that with another experience. I had been a, a teaching assistant uh, in a Vanderbilt class on American religious history. And uh, the professor was awesome teaching all these things, but I was kind of the hands-on in lab groups and trying to help students through stuff. And, and I got to know those students really, really well. There was one brother in there that was older, returning for a second uh, career in, in uh, religion, wanted to be a pastor, had a heart of gold. He was from uh, the Caribbean, and I loved that too from my time in, as a missionary in the Caribbean myself. He was an African-American, well, African Caribbean, and uh, and we just really got along really really well. And at one point he called me and said, Jared, can we get together for lunch, just the two of us? And I said, sure. And I figured, am I helping you on a paper you're writing or getting ready for this next exam? And well, we sat down at a restaurant across the street from school, and he said, um, Jared, I don't know how to put it, how to put this. I just I'm really looking for your help in understanding something about you personally, and about your church. Because um, coming to know you during this semester has been a blessing for me, and which I was grateful for, because coming to know him had been a blessing for me too. And he said, I don't sense a racist bone in your body. Which then makes me wonder, how can you be a Latter-day Saint? I just don't understand how... I mean, you grew up in L.A., and you had friends of other faiths and other cultures and other colors, and... <sighs> And you belong to this church that wouldn't let my people have priesthood. How can you square that in your own mind? And it led to a really beautiful and open and vulnerable and heartfelt conversation between friends that loved each other and loved the Lord. And we're just trying to make sense of a difficult part of the history of my church that he wanted to understand for personal reasons and not just for ecclesia, you know, historical or e ecclesiastical ones. Well, we talked for quite a while and I tried to help him understand some of the history that I'll share with you briefly now. 
But what it boiled down to, to me, the, the best takeaway from that conversation was simply this, that there was a beginning and an end to this practice. That for a period of history within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, those of African ancestry, and it wasn't just skin color, it was any African ancestry. Uh, you could look white, but if you had African ancestry, you couldn't have priesthood. You could look extremely dark. Aborigines in, in uh, Australia, for example, very dark skin, but no restriction on priesthood for them. It was only Africa. Uh, and those with, who, who uh, followed their ancestry back to Africa. What, what happened? There was a, a restriction on priesthood for them that had a beginning and then had an end. And what I said to this friend of mine, and what I'm going to try to walk us through now, is I wish we knew more about the beginning. We're learning more and more, uh, but there's so much about the front end of it that we just don't have documents about and don't, uh, don't have an understanding of. But, that's the bad news, here's the good news, we know all kinds of things about the end of it. And... And I hope that we can wrestle with this for the next little while as we study the Second Official Declaration, realizing that as confusing or messy or troubling even as the beginning of this might be, the, end, the story of its ending is, is absolutely glorious for reasons that I'll bring up in a moment. But let's start with the beginning. In the chapter heading of the Second Official Declaration, the newer edition, post-2013 of the Scriptures, says this by way of introduction. The Book of Mormon teaches that all are alike unto God, including black and white, bond and free, male and female. That's 2 Nephi 26, 33. Throughout the history of the church, people of every race and ethnicity in many countries have been baptized and have lived as faithful members of the church. During Joseph Smith's lifetime, a few black male members of the church were ordained to the priesthood. Early in its history, church leaders stopped conferring the priesthood on black males of African descent. And then here's the bad news. Church records offer no clear insights into the origins of this practice. But then hinting at the end, church leaders believed that a revelation from God was needed to alter this practice and prayerfully sought guidance. The revelation came to President Spencer W. Kimball and was affirmed to other church leaders in the Salt Lake Temple on June 1, 1978. The revelation removed all restrictions with regard to race that once applied to the priesthood. So that is our official introduction to this subject. Now there's all, other, all kinds of other introductions to it and helpful ways to navigate it. The church's uh, Gospel Topics essay on race and the priesthood is an excellent resource. There was an, an article written in Dialogue by Lester Bush. This was a groundbreaking piece of, of historiography, trying to make sense of history. And it was published in 1973, so five years before the Revelation came. And it was groundbreaking in terms of trying to make sense of whatever we could make sense of the, from the beginnings of this policy. Uh, why is it, who started it? Why is it in place? And is it set in stone? Or is there any flexibility on this issue? Now, it really was a groundbreaking piece of research. In fact, around that, that, that similar time period, President Kimball is asking apostles to do some, serious, some similar and serious research. And so uh, Bruce R. McConkie, for example, expert on the scriptures, study the scriptures as, as deeply as you can and tell me, is there anything scripturally that requires us to hold on to this restriction? Is there anything scripturally that justifies or that demands it? Let, let's do some more homework. You know, this is, you took no thought, save it was to ask me. Boy, did they take some thought in addition to asking him. Armand Moss uh, is a retired uh, sociologist of religion, an expert on the sociology of LDS history. He's written some amazing things about this. Uh, Greg Prince uh, wrote a book about uh, David O. McKay, and President McKay's administration was hugely important in all of this, so some of that research has been really helpful. Uh, Paul Reeve is a professor of history at the University of Utah, and he wrote a recent book on race throughout LDS history that is a game changer. Seriously, some amazing research that he has conducted. And if you want to stay closer to the family, turn to Edward Kimball's biography of his, his dad, Spencer W. Kimball. And this is not just a, a son talking about a dad. This is a, a, an excellent historian walking us through some difficult history 
as his father is wrestling with these issues and trying to, again, from his perspective, muddy beginning, we need a crystal clear ending. What can we do here? So a lot of great resources that are out there. Now, one thing we have to understand is racism in the United States at the beginning of this, of this dispensation. And it was brutal. Uh, in some ways, we can't completely blame them for it. I remember reading a book on the Founding Fathers that pointed out none of them had grown up in a, biracial, in, in a society that was truly biracial. I mean, yes, there were many you know, races in America at the time, but it was not a truly equal biracial society because there had never existed one. And it was, that took me aback, like, what, really? No. Wow. There's always been ins and outs and haves and have-nots and so on. So what America was trying to do truly was novel. All men are created equal. Well, even that statement was shocking for its day, but when Thomas Jefferson wrote it, he still had slaves at home. And as, as forward-thinking as the Declaration of Independence was, there's a lot in Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia that are horribly backwards thinking as far as race is concerned. So someone so ahead of his time as Jefferson, if he can still be racist, then what chance does anybody else have? Seriously. Uh, it's hard. I mean, you think of Abraham Lincoln. Well, he was ahead of his time. Well, yes, but his priority was the Union. And he even said, if I can save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I'll do it. If I can save the Union by freeing none of the slaves, I'll do it. If I can free the Union by, save, by freeing some of the slaves and not others, I'll do it. Which is exactly what he did. But the hope was the Union. Uh, I mean, it, racism was in the air and the water. It's what people breathed and ate and drank and just assumed. And that's tragic. And in some ways, that's nobody's fault. You can pin it on. It's just the natural, well, I guess Lucifer is the one you can pin it on. That's the natural man. Looking for differences in order to appeal to our own pride. And whatever that difference might be, whether it's racial or gender or education or socioeconomic status or whatever it might be, if God's great goal is the unity of Zion, then of course the adversary's great goal is going to be dividing the family of God. And he's been incredibly successful at that through time. Well, against that, you see a restored gospel pushing back against racism with what we just saw from the Book of Mormon, that all are alike unto God, male, female, so forget that divide, black, white, Forget that divide. Jew, Gentile. Forget even the religious divide. Bond free. I like that one because it seems to have a lot of different possibilities. Whatever you're in bondage to, get out of it. Okay? We saw the Lord's clear declaration in DNC 101. It is not right that any man should be in bondage one to another. You see in Jacob chapter 3, Jacob calling out the wicked Nephites for their racism. I mean, this is a generation removed from, from the separation of Nephites and Lamanites. But for Jacob, those were my older brothers. This is a family we're talking about. So do not revile them over some kind of skin color difference. Now, uh, there's a lot you could say about skin color difference in the Book of Mormon. And, and that's not crystal clear. And I tried to talk about that last year when we studied Alma chapter 3, for example, and, and Nephites versus Lamanites and so on. That, I, I don't, we don't have time, unfortunately, to get into that, into that issue. But to see the Book of Mormon trying to reconcile differences, there are places where it seems harsh as far as dividing things, but to see God's command throughout its time to, to reconcile, quote-unquote, racial differences is fascinating to me. And that's exa exactly what Joseph Smith was trying to do in his time period. But like it said in that intro, he did give the priesthood to worthy black males in his day. One of the more famous is Elijah Abel, baptized in 1832, and not only receiving the Melchizedek priesthood and becoming an elder in 1836, but becoming a 70 later in that same year. Now this isn't 70 general authority, they didn't have it in those days, but this is 70 in terms of the missionary arm of the church. And so, Elijah, go out and preach the gospel, especially to those of your own race and people. They need to know from someone that looks like them and feels with them that there is hope for them. And that's exactly what Elijah Abel did. He served multiple missions 
It was part of the 70s Quorum in Nauvoo, crossed the plains, helped build the Salt Lake Temple, lived faithful through the end of his life. Even when he was asking Brigham Young, I helped build this temple. Can I enter it and receive temple ordinances? I have the priesthood. But by then there was a policy in place that not, no priesthood and therefore no temple for those of African ancestry. I mean, even if you only take Elijah Abel as your example, that's a tricky one of where's the, where's the beginning? Because he had priesthood. He kept it through his life. But he can't go to the temple? When did that start? You could add to the mix Jane Manning James, oh, one of my heroines from the Restoration, who gathered a group of nine of her family members, all African Americans, joined the church in Connecticut, I believe, and then walked 800 miles to get to Nauvoo. Walked it because racist uh, canal boat drivers wouldn't let them on. Walked it with leaving bloody footprints in the snow until they prayed for a healing and received one. Came to Nauvoo and came to Joseph Smith's home and Joseph just in awe of their conversion story. To the point he's, you know, slapping a friend's knee next to him and says, can you believe this faith? This is amazing. He finds homes for all of these family members to be able to stay in as they're getting their feet underneath them. And then Jane herself, Jane Elizabeth Manning James, Joseph finds one day just weeping. And Joseph says, Jane, don't, don't you know that here we, wop, we wipe away all tears from every eye? Again, this is a preview of the millennial reign that the book of Revelation describes. We wipe away tears. Why are you crying? And she said, all my family members found places to live. They all found homes. I just haven't found one for me. And that's when Joseph says, oh, of course you have. Emma, this sweet sister says she doesn't have a home to live in. Is that true? And wonderful Emma says, of course you have a home to stay in. You can live right here with us. And she does. She is faithful through the martyrdom. She's faithful across the exodus into the, into the Salt Lake Valley. She's faithful through the Brigham Young administration, even when she can't go to the temple. She's faithful through the John Taylor administration with no temple blessings and the Wilfrid Woodruff administration with no temple blessings and the Lorenzo Snow administration with no temple blessings. She lived a long time. In fact, in those early days of the church uh, on, for testimony meeting, uh, at the beginning of the meetings, you couldn't bear your testimony unless you knew Joseph Smith personally. Let, let those who know personally bear their testimony first, then other people. Well, she was one of the last remaining testifiers of someone who know, knew Joseph, and she knew him incredibly well, having lived under the same roof. Well, finally, she met a prophet she couldn't outlive, and that was Joseph F. Smith, and the restriction was still in place. But so was her faith, and she even said that. I know as well now as I ever did then that this is all true. There's something amazing about that confirmation of truth, even when, when you feel like you're on the outside of things. And my hat goes off to those incredible African-American saints. And not just African-American, but African-Brazilian, like Hevecchio Martins. Uh, anyone that, that was closed off and wondered if the doors would ever open, I'm amazed at their faith and their patience. In some ways, theirs was a hard saying, who can hear it? And yet, as Jesus said to Peter, will you also go away? And his response, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. <laughs> Those words might include hard sayings, but they're the only words worth living by. So where else am I going to go? I can't receive the priesthood in this church. But it's the only church with priesthood, so I can't get priesthood anywhere else either. So I'll stay here and wait and hope and pray, which is what they did. Now I have to wait and hope and pray at all. The pivotal year seems to be 1852. There were things that led up to that. We talked about this a little bit back in section 134, where that final verse talks about we're going to plug our nose and not get in the way of slavery even though the Doctrine and Covenant says we don't believe in it, even though the Book of Mormon puts us all on the same level racially. But there were compromises with culture that, that were made. And we talked about that too. We saw it with the, the, the Methodists do it. It's like, ah, Francis Asbury, I feel like I'm enslaved to the culture of the South because they won't let me preach the gospel to them if I say anything against their practice of slavery. 
well, double that with, with the difficulty of establishing Zion in Missouri, a slave state. How are we going to do this? Uh, when W.W. Phelps writes his newspaper article telling free blacks, come, but notice that this, know that this is what life is like on the ground in a slave state like Missouri. And they dismantle, they, de they destroy the print shop and uh, scatter the type and tar and feather Bishop Partridge. It's like, whoa, they're serious about this. And all these Yankees are moving into a slave state. How is this going to work? And so some compromises were made. Now, Joseph, again, still gives priesthood. So what are we doing here? Then there seems to be some issues in winter quarters. There was an African-American convert named William McCary who was claiming prophetic gifts himself and was seducing women and some, causing some major problems. And there seems to be some evidence that that, that might have weighed heavily on, on Brigham Young's mind at the time of what, are we, what do we do about all this? They come to Utah and there are slave owners among the saints, which, you know, converts from the South. And so there are slaves among them too, including in the very first uh, party that enters the, the, the valley. And so what are we going to do about this? We've got America breathing down our necks from behind us and it's North versus South. And which do we have to pick sides? What, what can we do here? 1852 seems to be the year. There is a meeting of the territorial legislature that are all Latter-day Saints because nobody else lives here, basically. Uh, the governor of the territory also happens to be the president of the church, Brigham Young. Now, this is tricky because you wonder, well, is he speaking as prophet or as governor? And most people wouldn't have cared for the distinction. Uh, is he, is he stating a policy that's social or a principle that's religious? In fact, is it revelation and doctrine, or is this just policy and position? Is this meant to be permanent or temporary? Does, is this meant to be general across the whole church or just related to slave owners or southern members of the church in the south or wherever, you know, it, jurisdiction of, of governments and things? There, like I said, there's all kinds of question marks on the front end. Some would have even wondered, well, is it Brigham Young in 1852 or was it Joseph Smith earlier? And that's tricky because we don't have anything on record from Joseph Smith suggesting any kind of priesthood restriction. But then again, there are other things Joseph taught that we don't have record of either. I mean, show me where the endowment is laid out, right? Uh, so, so that's part of the question too. And there have been some scholars that say, ah, I don't know if Brigham would do this without knowing Joseph would have wanted him to. But again, we have no evidence that Joseph ever did any of it. So that leaves us with a bunch of questions regarding the beginning of this race restriction. So hard to know. What we do know from, from documentation is that those territorial legislature meetings in 1852. So at least by then, something is in place. And Brigham Young has made some forceful statements about it. Paul Reeve, who I mentioned is one of the best sources more recently on this, has written, The all-Mormon body of lawmakers comprised 39 members. 29 from northern states, three of foreign birth, and seven from the south, one of whom owned slaves. The representatives presided over a territory that brought southerners, northerners, foreigners, abolitionists, anti-abolitionists, free blacks, and enslaved blacks together. Talk about a, a melting pot in, in territorial Utah. Such a diverse gathering highlighted the universalism of the Mormon message and its appeal across racial, political, and ideological boundaries. And then Dr. Reeve says this, Yet legislatures met in 1852 in an effort to create order out of that diversity and to reassert racial, political, and ideological boundaries in a way that positioned white over black and free over bound. Brigham Young was at the forefront of that effort. He laid out his views regarding slavery while articulating a firm and forceful position concerning a race-based priesthood restriction grounded in biblical curses. Underlying all of it was a percolating anxiety, both within and without Mormonism, over interracial mixing. You see, Brigham Young, like every other Protestant in the, in, the, in, the, in the country, had been raised with racial understandings that were racist from, from, from modern day viewpoints. If we judge him by today's standards, then he was a racist along with pretty much every other American, except maybe John Brown. Uh, or William Lloyd Garrison, uh, and they had their own issues. I mean, even 
even people that didn't believe in slavery still believed in segregation during that time period. There was the thought of either immediate emancipation or gradual emancipation. Either way, we want it gone, but is it, do, we, do we force it upon the South right now or just let them outgrow it? Uh, and even with, with, the, the, with abolition, there's still a sense of, well, but we, we got to stay segregated pretty much, right? Do we send Africans back to Africa? Let's carve out a whole country there and call it Liberia, since we are liberating, liberating them. And the, and the slaves were like, back to Africa? What are you talking about? I'm, I'm no more African than you're English. I've never been there. We don't send you back to Europe. And so that didn't really go over well. Uh, some thought, well, do we carve out a black state somewhere in the West? But everyone's thinking of ways to stay separate, not to come together. And so... How do we do this in Utah, where we all are going to be together? Well, unfortunately, the, based on his understanding of Scripture, and this is where it gets tricky too, you're raised, he was raised Methodist, you're raised with, with thoughts about the curse of Cain or the curse of Ham or just some kind of less than. And so do you just bring that to the table with that these are your ongoing assumptions? Now, it's interesting that these weren't used as justifications for the restriction at the time that it was made there in 1852 or thereabouts. But years later, as people are trying to fill in the blanks, which is always dangerous, if God hasn't filled in a blank, eh, you're, it's careful if you're trying to fill it in yourself. People were, Latter-day Saints, were trying to come up with justifying reasons. And since we have some doctrine like, oh, well, are there racial differences in the Book of Mormon? Maybe that justifies it. Or there's that verse in the Book of, of Abraham about Pharaoh coming from a lineage that was cut off from priesthood. So maybe that's some of, uh, of it. By the way, that one was never used to justify it in the 19th century, but it was in the 20th. Uh, or we have a view of, of uh, premortality. There's a doctrine, but maybe that explains things. It sure doesn't seem fair from... Act 2 alone, but maybe some things happened in Act 1 that justify this unfair treatment in Act number 2. Yeah, either way, God's going to sort it out in Act number 3. Well, mm, careful. And because God never said any of those things, but people did, including leaders of the church at times, kind of getting out in front of God, which, like I said, is always dangerous to do. President Oaks has said, uh, God always tells us what his will is, but he doesn't always tell us why that's his will. And so careful about filling blanks that God has left blank, probably for a reason. So even when it came to the priesthood restriction, a young uh, Dallin H. Oaks said, I trusted the restriction, but I didn't have any faith in the reasons people were giving for it, because I couldn't find any justification for that. And thankfully, according to the Race and the Priesthood essay, Today, the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of, div of divine disfavor or curse, or that it reflects unrighteous actions in a premortal life, or that mixed race marriages are a sin, or that blacks or people of any other race or ethnicity are inferior in any way to anyone else. Church leaders today unequivocally condemn all racism, past and present, in any form. And I am grateful for that statement. I'm grateful for the work that President Nelson has been doing with the NAACP. It's amazing to see that. I'm grateful for what Ahmad Corbett wrote several years ago, a wonderful African-American convert, who talks about the Book of Mormon being the most racially inclusive uh, book in, in the world. And you're like, wait, huh? How's that work? And he said, think about it. Nephi's going to, to save and preach to Lamanites, Samuel the Lamanite going to try to, to call back the Nephites to, to repentance and to the Lord. And that, it's not just that verse at the end of 2 Nephi 26 about bond and free and black and white. Throughout the text, the Lord is trying to make them one. It's a beautiful thing to behold. And honestly, I see the future of the church being incredibly bright in this area. Even just the way that the church is organized by, by wards that are geographical rather than racial. And so we're all just thrown into the mix and we learn to love each other and get, and get along together. It's a, a beautiful thing. To see the growth of the church worldwide on the back of missionaries that shuffle the deck so that we are pushed out of our comfort zones and learn to love God's children who are different. I'm so grateful for that personally. 
to see the growth of the church in Africa, for example, and watch the center of gravity of the church start to shift to the global south. That's amazing. The number of temples that have been announced in Africa is exhilarating news to me. And how did we get in, in, into this direction of things? Well, let me say one last thing about that policy. 1852, which again, Professor Reeve puts it in, in these terms, as Joseph Smith had done before him, Young attempted to strike a middle ground, somewhere between what he viewed as the harsh brutalities of Southern slavery and the full racial equality advocated by abolitionists. That was a fine line to strike. They allowed slavery to persist, even in Utah territory, but any child born of slaves would not be a slave themselves. So kind of this sense of gradual emancipation, it cannot outlive the first generation. This needs to end. But then Reeve goes on, Young's speech that day represented the most complete enunciation of a rationale for a race-based priesthood restriction within Mormonism. Its emergence from a legislative debate was hardly a conducive setting for receiving and declaring revelation, which was a claim Young did not make. Now that's where we start to wonder, then how did it come to a point where revelation was needed to overturn it? There's a line in Lord of the Rings that has always struck me. As it's beginning to lay out the story of this ring, it says, some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. History became legend. Legend became myth. And I think one of the interesting things about the church, and actually human nature in general, is that the same course can unfold for us, where history becomes legend and legend becomes myth. Or in our version, where policy becomes practice and practice becomes tradition and tra tradition becomes doctrine and doctrine therefore must have been rooted in revelation. I call it the doctrinalization of things. It's like, is it doctrine that missionaries were supposed to go out at a certain age? No, it was a practice and we keep kind of adjusting it to see if there's a better way. It's like this entrenchment of tradition. And that, nope, this is the way it's always been done, and so that's the only way that it can be done. And again, when you live in a church of ongoing revelation, that of course, even when policies or procedures are, are, are thought about, they're going to be prayed over. They're going, to be, they're going to seek inspiration for those kinds of things. But that is a different animal than a thus saith the Lord revelation from God that is commanding people to do a certain thing, establishes a doctrine, for example. Okay? So you understand the difference I'm, I'm wrestling with? When Brigham Young spoke, again, whether as prophet or as governor, whether as policy or practice for the, the territory or for the church, obviously he was speaking for the church because we're not going to give priesthood or temple blessings. But is that a practice? Is it temporary? Brigham Young himself said, someday all of God's sons will receive priesthood. Uh, his understanding of, of race when it came to like uh, Abel and Cain was the thought of, well, all of Abel's descendants, posterity, need to, or, or Seth's, for, for example, need to receive priesthood before Cain's posterity will receive it. And again, it was a misunderstanding of Scripture to suggest that Africans came from Cain. But that was Protestantism in general. Okay? So there's a thought on Brigham Young's part. Someday this will all change. And someday the priesthood will be given to all of God's sons. But not right now. And then the question becomes, okay, was that just a decision for compromises with culture? Was this doctrine? How did you decide on this? Was just policy that, that you're seeking inspiration? Or was this revelation that, Brigham, this is exactly what has to happen right here? That's a tough one. And since we don't have all the, the documentation we would like, and we don't have perfect memories in terms of the people that were involved in this, like I said, you, you watch the history unfold, and it really is history becomes legend, and legend becomes myth. Or in this case, policy becomes doctrine becomes revelation and or at least this i'll put and this is what i said to my friend at the at the restaurant there's two possibilities to explain the front end policy or revelation was it was it god's will to cut off priesthood and temple from his african american sons and daughters uh, or was it just policy from brigham young or whomever else now on the front end we don't know 
And that forces the issue on the back end. Here's what I mean by that. If it's just policy, then policy can change policy. In fact, there's some statements from, from uh, David O. McKay that basically says that. Uh, Hubie Brown, same thing, where it's like, if it's just policy, let's change it right now. Uh, I can. Man can, can re revoke man. Uh, and policy can be changed or redefined by policy. Ah, but here's the problem. I don't know for sure if it was just policy on the front end. What if it was revelation? Over time, the passage of it, people are starting to remember. I think it was. I think it was Joseph Smith, in fact. Uh, I don't know. Uh, no, I think pretty, pretty much Brigham Young was, thus saith the Lord. Ah, uh, okay. I don't know. And so if on the front end, we, the, there's a possibility of revelation, then we can't just settle for policy change on the back end. If there's two possibilities on the front, then there's only one possibility on the back, and that's revelation. It has to be. And until it comes, we can't, we can't budge, we can't move as much as we would want to. And believe me, they wanted to. The ministry to really follow through this is David O. McKay's. He was the first apostle to do a worldwide tour of the, of the church. When he's in, uh, in Hawaii in like 1921, he meets this family where the, the mother is Polynesian and the, husband, the father is African-American. And they have this amazing family, all faithful in the church. And Elder McKay even calls Heber J. Grant and says, can we, can we make an exception to the rule for this family? Such a, they're so faithful. Can we not give him priesthood? Can we not seal this family together? And President Grant said, I, we just don't have the authority to make exceptions to that rule. Believe me, I'm as sympathetic as you are on this, David. We just can't do this. Well, time keeps passing. And when David McKay is president of the church, he's exploring these possibilities. He, in fact, he's getting more letters, more mail from Africa than the rest of the church combined. There's a fascinating history to study about that time period as he's sending missionaries out on like fact-finding missions because he's, I'm getting like letterhead that says Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, Abba Nigeria branch. And he's all, we don't have a branch in Nigeria. Who are these people? Well, there's people that God is inviting into his kingdom. Even when the church is not yet sending missionaries out to, to, to roll out the red carpet. Amazing stories of dreams and visions and experiences with the Book of Mormon and people knowing the gospel is true and preaching it to other people in these African villages and gathering congregations of the church with no priesthood and no baptism and, and no authority. And, and here's David and McKay going, what do we do? What can we do here? Churches, I mean, he sends missionaries to find out how things are, and they come back and they're just blown away with a number of people that have deep, committed testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they're starting to figure out how do we do it? Can we send missionaries? And, but no local leadership? How is this going to be possible? The church is, is blooming in Brazil at the time that had such a history of slavery in prior centuries that... that it's hard to trace your ancestry all the way out uh, without crossing Africa at some point. And so what do we do with that? And the church is building a temple. By that, by that time, it's Spencer W. Kimball. But again, for David O. McKay, it's, I just want to know God's will. Because if it's policy, I'll switch it yesterday. If it's revelation, I have to have revelation. And I'm praying for it. People are often quick to just throw Brigham Young under the bus and call him a racist and say this was 100% human error. Well, President uh, Uchtdorf was, was good and wise to admit that yes, we're human and we do make errors, but he's, he wasn't specific as to what they've been. And I think we need to be careful about throwing specific prophets under specific buses, because was it necessary for a time or for a season or for a purpose? Perhaps, because even when I, when, I, when I get to David O. McKay and see him pleading with God for a revelation, just like Spencer W. Kimball would a decade later, that revelation didn't come, even when David O. McKay was ready for it. Was, was the church not ready for it? Perhaps. 
Were there other reasons in God's mind? I don't know. And I can't, I don't want to fill in blanks for him. But according to the research that's been done on David O. McKay, it's amazing how desperately he wanted the revelation to come. And it didn't. Well, time then passed and <laughs> a feisty Spencer W. Kimball, who had also had experience with diversity and and racial minorities and had a heart so outsized for his diminutive body. He, he pled with the Lord. He wrestled with him day after day and month after month and year after year until a revelation finally came to him. Similar to what's going on with Wilfred Woodruff in the 18, late 1880s and 1890. Remember he said, this was not a, a decision I made. <laughs> I've been thinking about this and receiving revelation about this for a long time. Well, same with Spencer W. Kimball. At one point he said, I know the Lord could change his policy. And there's the assumption, it's his. And release the ban and forgive the possible error which brought about the deprivation. So he's, here's even a prophet saying, it, it, maybe it was wrong. Maybe it was an error all along the way. I don't know. But it lost in the midst, in the midst of, the, of the past, we are limited to only one way out in the future, and that is revelation. So he said, day after day, I went alone and with great solemnity and seriousness in the upper rooms of the temple. And there I offered my soul and offered my efforts to go forward with the program. I wanted to do what he wanted. I talked about it to him and said, Lord, I want only what is right. We are not making any plans to be spectacularly moving. We want only the thing that thou dost want. And we want it when you want it and not until. Sounds a lot like Wilford Woodruff to me. This is what we want. This is the, the only way out that I can see. But if it's not your will, then I'll go to the grave defending this doctrine. And President Kimball felt the same about that one. Now, when it finally came to a point where he felt that he knew, he didn't just pull rank. He, need, he knew that the saints need to agree with this. The Quorum of the Twelve Apostles needs to agree with this. This is DNC 107, unanimity in authority. And so what does he do? He keeps pleading and praying. He begins to discuss things with the, the First Presidency counselors and the members of the Quorum of the Twelve. And eventually he invites them all to join him in the Salt Lake Temple for a meeting of sacred prayer. President Hinckley described it this way. President Kimball raised the question before his brethren, his counselors and the apostles. Following the discussion, we joined in prayer in the most sacred of circumstances. So think about that in terms of temple context. President Kimball himself was voice in that prayer. I do not recall the exact words that he spoke, but I do recall my own feelings and the nature of the expressions of my brethren. There was a hallowed and sanctified atmosphere in the room. For me, it felt as if a conduit opened between the heavenly throne and the kneeling, pleading prophet of God who was joined by his brethren. The Spirit of God was there, and by the power of the Holy Ghost there came to that prophet an assurance that the thing for which he prayed was right, that the time had come, and that now the wondrous blessings of the priesthood should be extended to worthy men everywhere, regardless of lineage. Every man in that circle, by the power of the Holy Ghost, knew the same thing. It was a quiet and sublime occasion. We left that meeting subdued and reverent and joyful. Not one of us who was present on that occasion was ever quite the same after that. Nor has the church been quite the same. Again, can you hear echoes of Wilford Woodruff? That we all knew the same thing? Especially the way that prayer must have been offered and echoed to me is how oh, to have been a fly on that wall. There's something about the experience that they had that confirmed to everyone present that the time had come. And it, it did change everything. Uh, Spencer W. Kim was like, okay, announce it to the, to the church, announce it to the world. And, and so they did. That is what the second official declaration is all about. It begins, to whom it may concern. And again, it concerned everybody. On September 30th, 1978, at the 148th 
semi-annual general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The following was presented by President N. Eldon Tanner, first counselor in the first presidency of the church. Now by this, the revelation had already come a few months earlier and announced, and there was rejoicing throughout the church. A uh, beautiful story of the, a woman who became, shortly thereafter, the first African-American sister missionary. And she was in Provo, a student at BYU at the time. And people were just honking their horns and shouting for joy. She was out in the streets and strangers would pull over and say, have you heard the news? And of course she had. And just the absolute rejoicing over the fact that God had opened the heavens and revealed truth to his prophets. Truth that everyone had been, not everyone, sadly there were racist exceptions in, among church members, but that the vast majority of church members worldwide were so anxiously waiting for joining President uh, Kimball in prayer in their own way that the, that the revelation would come. Well, here's the announcement of it at General Conference. In early June of this year, the First Presidency announced that a revelation had been received by President Spencer W. Kimball, extending priesthood and temple blessings to all worthy male members of the church. So again, this is a declaration that a revelation had come. President Kimball has asked that I advise the conference that after he had received this revelation, which came to him after extended meditation and prayer in the sacred rooms of the Holy Temple. So that's him on his own receiving these preliminary revelations that then prepared him to invite other people into a shared revelatory experience. He presented it to his counselors, who accepted it and approved it. It was then presented to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who unanimously approved it and was subsequently presented to all other general authorities who likewise approved it unanimously. Elder Peterson and Elder Stapley were not physically present at that time. Uh, Elder Stapley was in the hospital. Elder Peterson was out on, on church business overseas. But <laughs> President Kimball went to the hospital to talk to Elder Stapley, got on the phone to talk with Elder Peterson. Both were, were overjoyed by this, by this change as well. Both accepted. Then, after the unanimous agreement among general authorities, President Kimball has asked that I now read this letter, June 8, 1978, to all general and local priesthood officers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints throughout the world. So again, this is just a chance for the whole church to collectively support, sustain, uphold, agree on this. But the letter had already gone out in June, as soon as, the, as, soon as they could share the good news. And here it was, dear brethren, and never before had that title been so inclusive as far as what priesthood brethren really would be. As we have witnessed the expansion of the work of the Lord over the earth, we have been grateful that people of many nations have responded to the message of the restored gospel and have joined the church in ever increasing numbers. This in turn has inspired us with a desire to extend to every worthy member of the church all of the privileges and blessings which the gospel affords. You see some of what precipitated this? This was not a bunch of angry Latter-day Saints demanding their rights. This was a bunch of meek disciples simply living the gospel of Jesus Christ as best as they knew how. And being patient and having faith and, and knowing that God knew them and their situation, but that they were le led by living prophets of God, of God that would receive whatever revelation should come. It's, to me, it's beautiful to picture President, Nel uh, President Kimball and others just seeing these are such good people. Remember that what pushed a young Elder McKay to even ask for an exception to the rule. Uh, the work is expanding. People are joining against the odds in some way. What, what can we do for them? Next paragraph. Aware of the promises made by the prophets and presidents of the church who have preceded us that at some time in God's eternal plan, all of our brethren who are worthy may receive the priesthood. And witnessing the faithfulness of those from whom the priesthood has been withheld, we have pleaded long and earnestly in behalf of these our faithful brethren, spending many hours in the upper room of the temple, supplicating the Lord for divine guidance. So there's more of that same kind of sense. We have witnessed their faithfulness. They are our brothers. Can we plead in their behalf? This is like Paul at the Jerusalem conference in Acts chapter 15, I've spent time with Gentile converts and they are just as faithful as Jewish converts. Can we not extend the blessings of the gospel to them? 
Honestly, 1978 was just as dramatic for the church as Peter's vision uh, and then extend the gospel to Cornelius first and then throughout the Gentile world after. Uh, amazing what took place with all of that. Same thing happening here. But notice that first phrase, aware of the promises. This was not a change of doctrine that was required. The promise was always in place. This isn't changing the plan of salvation. It's not, I'm not rewriting things. It's simply, when will it come? The promises are there, and we're aware of them. Is it time to extend them, Father? And it was. In the next paragraph, he says, He has heard our prayers, and by revelation has confirmed that the long-promised day has come. That's my favorite phrase in this whole thing, the long-promised day. This was always in the mind and will of God. It was always on the, in the, on the mind of Brigham Young, even. The question was when. And now the long-promised day has come, when every faithful, worthy man in the church may receive the holy priesthood, and all that goes with it, power to exercise its divine authority, and enjoy with his loved ones every blessing that flows therefrom, including the blessings of the temple. Accordingly, all worthy male members of the church may be ordained to the priesthood without regard for race or color. Then this interesting instruction, priesthood leaders are instructed to follow the policy of carefully interviewing all candidates for ordination to either the Aaronic or the Melchizedek priesthood to ensure that they meet the established standard for worthiness. So there's still, there's still order in this. There's still difference between Aaronic and Melchizedek. There's still a requirement for worthiness. There's just no difference anymore. And everyone can be treated equally. There is a blanket statement regarding the general policy and practice of the church. But it's still an individual approach where people receive priesthood one by one. He then concludes, We declare with soberness that the Lord has now made known his will for the blessing of all his children throughout the earth, who will hearken to the voice of his authorized servants and prepare themselves to receive every blessing of the gospel. Sincerely yours, Spencer W. Kimball and Eldon Tanner, Mary and G. Romney, the First Presidency. Interesting that statement. It's time to bless the whole world as, and those who will hearken to the voice of his authorized servants. It is prophetic guidance that has been running throughout the history of the church. P people called of God to do their very best to ascertain his will, not just for them individually, but for the church collectively. Then, recognizing Spencer W. Kimball as the prophet, seer, and revelator, and as President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it is proposed that we as a constituent assembly accept this revelation as the word and will of the Lord. All in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Any opposed by the same sign. And the vote to sustain the foregoing motion was unanimous in the affirmative. Oh, Salt Lake City, Utah, September 30th, 1978, what a day. When the whole church could join in the raised hands and raised hearts of those apostles and prophets from June. Uh, from people receiving priesthood from, from June on the way to July, August, now September, and now over 40 years later, these blessings still continuing to flow. They forever will. It's amazing to see what happened this day because God spoke to a prophet that was desperately trying to connect with him. You know, it's interesting over the years, uh, as I've tried to explain this to people, and as I tried to explain to my, my sweet black friend at lunch that day at Divinity School, there's a principle of precedent out there. When we see, for example, that God confined the priesthood to the Levites in the house of Israel, not because they were better, but simply because God had a, an order in place and then spread those priesthood-holding Levites throughout the tribes of Israel so that everyone could be blessed by them. It's always exclusivity in pursuit of inclusivity. That's how God works. Or when we see confining the gospel to the house of Israel and only after Peter's vision, expanding it to the Gentile world. And so there is a principle of precedent that I've often called upon to try to help people navigate this race restriction that he started with some and then expanded to others. But the way it's presented here, I've sometimes done this where I write on the board precedent, P-R-E-C-E-D-E-N-T. 
and then and explain it. And then underneath it, I'll write the word president, P-R-E-S-I-D-E-N-T. Now, precedent and president sound a lot alike. But as we've wrestled with this and thought, which is the better explanation for, the, for what took place? Are we just following precedents and like, well, that's how they did it then, so it's how we ought to do it now? Or do we trust in prophetic guidance? Do we trust that God's servants are seeking to know his will and to implement it, regardless of what people will think of themselves or of the church or of anything else? trying to do what is right as best as they can ascertain it. I'm grateful for the principle of precedent with Levites and Gentiles and so on, but I'm more grateful for the principle of president and Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and David O. McKay and Spencer W. Kimball and Russell M. Nelson. It's amazing to see God lead his church as he always has through people, imperfect but trying doing their very best to understand God's will for the collective whole. There's a fascinating verse in 1 Corinthians 14 where Paul is still wrestling with spiritual gifts and kind of concerned that so many people are really stoked about the gift of tongues because it's kind of a shock and awe. Like, whoa, they're speaking a language nobody knows or whatever it might be. And so he, he compares in 1 Corinthians 14 the gift of tongues with the gift of prophecy. Tongues, this amazing outward manifestation. Prophecy, a testimony of Jesus. Prophecy, guiding through prophetic gifts and revelation what, what needs to be done. And, and he says, the problem with tongues is it doesn't always help people unless there's somebody to interpret it. Whereas prophecy is meant to help everyone because it shows God's will. And then he says this interesting thing that to me reminds me of this what we've studied today in both the first and second official declarations. Because there will always be skeptics out there that say, ah, oh, the, church, the church just caved to political pressure in the 1890s, and they just caved to political pressure in the 1970s. Which to me is always seems a little bit late, since the, the peak of civil rights movement was more 50s and 60s. And by late 1970s, people were probably thinking, oh, those Latter-day Saints are never going to change. Well, just, just wait for God to speak, right? So I'll admit that in the face of that kind of skepticism, the principle of president probably doesn't mean anything. So let me quote this verse from Paul. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. In other words, <laughs> that's, that, that, that shock and awe, that outward kind of proof, like, oh, they're doing something that's impossible. I, maybe I should take this thing seriously. Well, that's for outsiders. What about for insiders? Paul goes on, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. In other words, outsiders aren't going to believe in the gift of prophecy. And I guess that's to be expected. Whereas for those who believe that God does reveal his will to his servants, the prophets, that whether by mine own voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same, then this is the solution we all were waiting and hoping and praying for. I've heard it said when it comes to these kinds of issues, to those who believe in revelation and prophecy, there is no problem. And to those who do not believe in revelation and prophecy, there is no solution. I sensed that when I was speaking with that group at Tennessee State, that without an understanding of prophets, there's no solution here. I sensed it differently, though, when I talked to my friend, that we knew each other and respected each other and loved each other. And, and this is what I said to him in closing. That's what I'll say to you in closing, too. I'm sorry for the racist history of, of humanity, and including the way that that racism has been manifest even within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I pray that I may never be guilty of that myself, and, and for whatever it's worth, I am sorry for the hardships that people suffered in the past and continue to suffer in the present. We still have much work to do to become Zion. But I will say this, and I said this to my friend, every church has had to come to grips with its racist past. Every 
bit of humanity has had to come to grips with the problems of its, of its ancestry. But there is one difference. Every other church that has come to grips with this decided to do so. They leaned into the better angels of their nature. They discussed things together. And as a church body, they decided we need to stop segregating things. We need to treat each other with kindness. Now, that's an uneven uh, result, unfortunately. But what we're trying as a, as a human race. Now, there's a difference for Latter-day Saints. Because one of the occupational hazards, if we want to call it that, of having prophetic leadership is we can't just decide on our own. We can't just say, this is what we're going to do it. All in favor? We can't just have majority rule. There are prophets and apostles whose calling it is to find out the will of God and then to let it be known. And so on the negative side, it took us longer. Because for whatever reason, that revelation wasn't coming. And we were willing to stick with a difficult circumstance for everyone until we knew from God what we should do. So on the negative side, it was slow in coming. Revelation can sometimes do that. But as I said to my friend, here's the good news. Whereas every other church could say, you are equal in our eyes. Because Latter-day Saints were forced to wait on a revelation that was unmistakable, we can now testify to our black brothers and sisters that you are equal in God's eyes. And it wasn't just a, a kind-hearted old man, but it was prophets, seers, and revelators that parted the heavens and allowed God to speak for himself and say to all of you and everyone else that there is no black or white or bond or free or male or female or Jew or Gentile. All are alike in my eyes. And God made that clear. I'm grateful that we, that we had to wait for that because to me it was worth waiting for. I don't want to minimize in any way the suffering that people have had to go through because of racism, past or present. But I do want to declare unequivocally that God is your Father in heaven and that he loves you perfectly. And I pray that in some way the Spirit can testify to you of that reality to help bind up broken hearts and to help heal wounds and to help everyone do their very best not to add to burdens that have been so long standing in the past. I have sometimes said to, to people trying to make sense of Christian history and or Latter-day Saint history that the history of Christianity is the long and sometimes painful process of trying to catch back up to Jesus. He was so far ahead of his time when it came to treat, treating w females and people of other nationalities and races, the way he approached the Samaritans, the way he would pop the bubble of, of ethnocentrism and senses of superiority among his own people was beautiful and so far ahead of its time. Christianity is still catching back up to that. In a much smaller but in a similar way, what is Latter-day Saint history? It's the long and somewhat painful process of trying to catch back up to Joseph Smith. He was a far cry from Jesus, but he was so far ahead of his time when it came to gender, when it came to race, in so many areas, and we are still trying to catch back up to what he, what he revealed to us. If we can try to catch back up to Joseph in our ultimate attempts to catch back up to Jesus, someday we'll get there. And where's there? It's Zion. Where regardless of gender differences or racial differences or socioeconomic differences or differences in any way, we will be one heart and one mind dwelling together in righteousness with no poor among us. If you're not one, the Lord said, you're not mine. So may we be one so that we can be his.